welcome this morning to We Are Calderdale 2022. I'm Michael Holgate um, and I am co-hosting this morning's event. Um, the last time that I stood here at uh, Calderdale College was back in uh, March 2020 and there were a lot of um, colleagues here that day for the We Are Calderdale 2020 and little did we know that only a few days later um, we would be plunged into lockdown and the world changed. Um, one thing that really struck me as we worked through that awful pandemic was the way that communities in Calderdale came together and really supported each other. So it's really apt that this morning's event is titled Calderdale Together. Before we start, I've just some housekeeping notices. Um, we're not expecting a, a fire drill or an emergency drill, so the alarm does go. Uh, colleagues from the college will direct us out of this room uh, into the car park and we're going to assemble next to the fence. Uh, for those of you who um, haven't found them yet, uh, the toilets are just down the corridor on the right hand side. Um, we do have Wi-Fi uh, this morning, um, which is provided by the college, and I would ask you to use that responsibly. Um, and you will need to use your phones a little bit later on, but if you could please keep them to either um, silent or vibrate, that will be absolutely fine. Um, I'm now going to introduce my co-hosts, uh, Natalie and Habiba. Uh, over to you. Good morning, my name is Natalie. And I'm Habiba. We students from Trinity Sixth Form. I'm doing LOL Chemistry, Biology and Maths. And I'm studying Biology, Chemistry and Psychology. Today we take great pleasure in welcoming you here at Calderdale College for We Are Calderdale 2022. Students from both Trinity and Calderdale College have played a very important role in organizing the event today. As well as helping to prepare the event, students from Trinity Sixth Form will be taking part in a panel about responding to the climate emergency. Students from Calderdale College have produced three performances which will be shown throughout this afternoon. They also will be helping throughout the day helping you with any problems and even serving lunch, which will be a sustainable picnic. We're sure you'll enjoy the day, so thanks for being here and thanks for people who are watching it online. If you're using social media, please tweet any thoughts or comments with hashtag WeAreCalderdale. We'll hand you back over to Michael now to introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Natalie and Habiba. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the opening from Tracy Brabin, the Mayor of West Yorkshire. Hello, I'm Tracy Brabin, the Mayor of West Yorkshire, and welcome to We Are Calderdale 2022. And I'm so sorry that I can't be with you, but I'm excited for you knowing that this is the first in-person event for over two years bringing people from different communities together and having conversations about the future, what is so important, isn't it? I'm so pleased to see everyone will be able to have a platform to share and discuss their ideas about our region. Calderdale Together couldn't be a more important focus for today and it'll feed into my thinking about the whole of West Yorkshire too. It's so great to see local partners and leaders gathering under the framework of Vision 2024. And of course, it's easy to see why. Calderdale is full of enterprising, talented, creative folk, and it's distinctive and definitely kind and resilient. You'll be hearing from familiar and some unheard voices who are doing vital work in our communities as they look to collaborate and to innovate, inspire and support each other through working together. Having well-paid skilled jobs on our doorstep is vitally important to levelling up in West Yorkshire. Our region is full of talented youngsters, but we need jobs here in Calderdale and next door in Bradford and Kirklees to keep our best talent in the region. 
across West Yorkshire, we're helping to create and grow opportunities that can be accessed by anyone from anywhere. So it's so great to see that young people from Coldedale College and Trinity Sixth Form Academy are involved this morning. The future we're discussing today is yours, and it's vital that you are part of any discussion that shapes it. There are so many important conversations going on, and I'd love to have been part of it, around skills as well as making Calderdale the distinctive, kind and resilient place we all know it is. I really hope you enjoy the day, and keep the conversations flowing so that Calderdale and of course the whole of West Yorkshire can continue working together towards a better future for the next generation. Thank you. That was Tracy Brabin, the Mayor of West Yorkshire. So, without further ado, uh, it gives me now great pleasure to welcome to the stage the Leader of the Council, Councillor Tim Swift, MBE, uh, to give his address of welcome. Councillor Swift. Thank you very much, Michael, and um, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Natalie, Natalie and Habiba for the role you're taking on today. Um, well, it's good to see so many familiar and new faces here together. And as, as we've already touched on, this is the first time in over two years that we've been able to come together for the, at, at the college for the event in this form. But of course, we do also still have many people watching the event online as we're also running this as a live broadcast. So welcome too to anyone who's watching from locations elsewhere in Calderdale or beyond. And I guess one of the things that we've gained from the last two years is a bit more confidence in using our technologies creatively. And indeed, I understand that one of the panel members later this morning is actually joining us from their living room in Sunday Andalusia. Um, I would say technology willing, but my general experience of remote meetings is that if people are joining from a long way away, they work fine. It's if people are, it's, it's if, it's if people are a mile away that you have problems, uh, particularly if they're anywhere in the upper valley. So, um, great to be here and just reminded by seeing the opening address from Tracy that, of course, two years ago, the last time we had, had, had this event in person, we didn't have an elected mayor for West Yorkshire. And it's just starting to remember as we go on this morning all the things that have happened over the previous two years. Just want to start by saying thank you again to all the students from Calderdale College and the Sixth Form Academy in Trinity who have helped put this event together. Um, who are involved throughout the morning. Um, I know also there's been a huge amount of preparation work gone into this event from all sorts of all, all sorts of people, and big thanks to everyone who's been involved. Just talked about what's happened over two years, but um, if I can be afforded a little bit of personal reflection, um, I've, 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 uh, I've, I've been leader of the council now for so it was 10 years since I first became leader of the council, um, which is quite unusual in Calderdale terms, to, to ha have that length of time. And uh, for all that that's been pretty tough at times, um, it really has been, and it continues to be, the most enormous privilege to be able to serve this community and the place that I love. I do believe very strongly that the best forms of leadership are shared, they're collective, and they're collaborative. And the, what reflects best on any leader is when we allow others to thrive and do well. And I hope that that's very much reflected in both the values and the ways we're working together towards our vision for 2024. But along with the many opportunities and successes, <clears throat> what I've personally found hardest and most wearing at times is the pervading cynicism and mistrust of civic leadership. Yes, that's most directly, of course, about those who are elected, but it's broadened out at times to poison attitudes to everyone in positions of responsibility. And the last year, culminating, I have to say, in a certain report published yesterday, has certainly not been a good one for trust in public institutions. And that matters for what we want to do, because without mutual respect and trust, how are we able to work success together successfully to address some of the huge challenges that we're facing going forwards? And I think we've got some really great examples, as Michael's all touched on already, in Calderdale. We've seen the importance of trust and collaboration throughout the pandemic, how we all responded together to support people, to keep people safe, and how we've worked together towards recovery in the past year. 
we're seeing it now in continuing collaborations of looking at ways that we can all help to support our communities through the growing cost of living crisis. And we're seeing Calderdale at its best in welcoming those who've lost their homes in Ukraine through the Home for Ukraine program. Calderdale has demonstrated time and time again how by coming together we can work to shape a better future for all of us. And that's very much the theme of this year's event, Calderdale Together. And we'll be exploring how we can come together to respond to the climate emergency, how we come together to collaborate, innovate and inspire and how we come together to support each other. There'll be opportunity to hear from our panels who will seek to answer some of the questions sent in by the audience in advance. And we'll hear from some inspiring people who live and work in Calderdale, who'll be telling their own powerful and compelling stories of how they've supported others or received support themselves in times of adversity. Throughout the morning, we'll also be seeing and engaging with thought-provoking performances from the Calderdale College students relating to the key themes of the event. And as some of you will already seen, there'll be a marketplace during the break with a filmed version for those watching online. So an opportunity to stretch your legs and find out more about some of Calderdale's fantastic organizations and services. And for those present, a sustainable picnic at the end. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming, for giving up the time. But most of all, thank you for everything you all do together to help deliver on our vision and make Calderdale the greatest place to live and live and and lead a life worth living. Thank you. Thank you, it was really good. It's time for our first performance. It's set in the new, near future and explores how we all can come together to support people in need.
Well, I think you'll agree that was really moving and thought-provoking, and we are joined this morning uh, by some of the students who created that, uh, that wonderful piece of uh, Shadow Theatre from Calderdale College, and I think we should give them another round of applause. <laughs> Superb, thank you. Um, so now it's kind of over to you, um, a bit of audience participation, a bit of a warm-up activity. Uh, don't worry, um, Brogan from Active Calderdale isn't going to make you do the park run or uh, start jumping up and down doing star jumps in the car park. What we'd like you to do is to follow the instructions on the screen. And this is really to, to get a feel of the mood of today and if you're joining us through the live streaming online you can um, access this through uh, whatever platform you're using whether that's Facebook or YouTube. Um, I did ask our IT department if uh, anybody's got any problems whether they could give us any advice but all they said was switch it off and switch it back on again so that's not going to be any use. Um, we do have students here who are probably more savvy than, uh, certainly more savvy than I am, so we'll be able to help if you're struggling with this, but uh, it should be fairly straightforward. So um, go to the website, um, and the idea is you just submit one word anonymously just to show the mood of today. And as if by magic, they should all appear on the screen. He said, it works. I didn't put the nervous bit on. I, I... Was that you, Habiba, that put nervous on? No, no. <laughs> Not guilty. That'll be the IT department that says connected, probably, won't it? That uh, input that one. Now, I think the hopeful. That's that's really that's really positive. I think that's that's really really shining through at the moment, isn't it? Optimistic, excited, interested, curious. Yeah. Hopeful's taking some beats in, isn't it? Proud, that's a good one. That's a good one for Calderdale and for Yorkshire as well. I thought proud we're going to take over hopeful then for a moment. But. Positive and happy, they're good ones. Yep, that's great. It's really, really good to get a feeling of not only in the room, but also our wider audience. And somebody's put reconnected councillor, so that must be somebody in an adjacent building or down the valley perhaps, yeah. <laughs> I think Proud's taking over hopeful now, isn't it? Should run a, run a book on this, I think. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay. So I think that's really, really useful. And it does get a feel of the, the mood, as I say, not only in the room, but also um, for those colleagues and partners, family, friends, residents who are viewing this event online. So thank you very much for that. Uh, give your thumbs a rest now and you can sit back because we um, are shortly going to have a film. Just um, before I, I introduce this film, I've, I've worked for Calderdale Council for oh, 16 years now, probably. Um, yeah, I know you don't think I'm that old, but uh, I started very young. No, seriously, I, I've worked for Calderdale Council for about 16 years, and I'm, I'm really passionate about telling people just what a wonderful place Calderdale is to work. Um, we've got some fantastic scenery. We've got all the heritage. We've got the tradition. We've got the, the people, and it's really the people in Calderdale that I, I value, and I love working with you. Um, it, it started off as a bit of a... I don't know, a bit of a, a, a mission to educate people where Calderdale is and just the, the great things that are happening in Calderdale. And it almost felt that Calderdale was kind of this golden nugget of the region that we held our light under a bushel. We're very, we are very proud, as it said on the screen earlier, but we're Yorkshire, we're really friendly and the people are absolutely amazing. But in recent years, that, that kind of mission it doesn't seem as though it's it's kind of hiding its light under a bushel anymore because we've been exposed through media through television through theater on a on a global scale and this next film really does exemplify that and it's entitled hollywood and it's all about production in calderdale it's been a record year for tourism in Calderdale. Visits from overseas are at an all-time high. The uptake has been dubbed the Gentleman Jack Effect. Calderdale has become a destination of choice for many television and big screen productions. So it's no wonder the name Hollywood is starting to stick. We owe a huge thanks to Sally Wainwright and her love for Calderdale for putting us on the big screen, attracting thousands of tourists from across the globe to Calderdale. Throughout the pandemic, production continued across the borough with the filming of the second series of Happy Valley and Gentleman Jack. We spoke with Sally at the premiere of Gentleman Jack's second series in Halifax. I just tend to write things set in Calderdale because I because it happens like that, it's not a conscious decision. I think it's really picturesque. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it, there's the stunning landscape and then there's the, you know, places like this, the Peaceau. You know, Halifax has got some extraordinary architecture as well as the landscape and some extraordinary nooks and crannies. We also managed to catch up with Gentleman Jack herself, Saran Jones, to ask her how it felt to be back in Anne Lister's shoes. I think I was almost feeling my way in the first series and now I feel like I know the landscape, I know Shibden, I know those hills, I know those cobbled streets. They were hard on my knees, but I love them. Um, and I just think it's such a, a, a part of the show. Sally has painted it as a character, painted Shibden Hall as a, a character as part of the show. And it's wonderful because we get to bring people um, here and people who didn't know about it before now have wonderful holidays here as well. It's, it's great. That's not all though, as we welcomed Disney with open arms to Halifax earlier this year for the filming of Secret Invasion. We managed to secure an interview with the location manager on set, who just loved Calderdale. For this particular show, we had a brief, which was to find a square. And there were a few other sort of elements that the square needed to have. I think our scout was very fortunately on Twitter and an event came up in the Peace Hall and she said, have you seen this place? And I love it when you bring a crew and they all get involved with the local community and the local shops. And, you know, I think it's just a lovely place to be. I think Halifax is such a friendly place. It feels very much like a community. I think when you meet people, they are curious and they want to stop and chat. And I'm absolutely down for that from the South Wales Valley, so it's a very similar vibe. So yeah, I would say the people of Halifax have been nothing but interested, intrigued, and also often want to share something about what they know about Halifax as well, which I just find wonderful. And that's partly how I came to find out exactly all the different places we could film here anyway. So I wouldn't have found Dean Clough if it hadn't been for a conversation with a local. 
filming is taking place right across the borough. Earlier this year, social media users were even convinced the council had installed a Hollywood sign at Beacon Hill. We were lucky enough to get an exclusive tour at the set for Ackley Bridge, right after the filming of season four. Where location manager Chris told us what it's like to be back for the fourth time since 2014. Halifax for Ackley Bridge, because it's one of the longest running things here. I think they've really taken it to heart. And um, just in passing, if I'm walking through town or I've been looking at a location and someone clocks me and says, oh, you're a film crew? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Ackley Bridge. Yeah, great. Love, we love it. Yeah, it's great for, the, great for the area. The difference in architecture is striking. You've got such lovely mill buildings down there, the, the Great Peace Hall, which is going to be so used, I think, from now on. We're so pleased our borough has become a distinctive and much-loved location for filming, with plans for further productions in 2023. So lights, camera, action. See you in Hollywood. Put it in your head, baby. It's now time for our first Coming Together to Respond to the Climate Emergency. This panel will consist of fellow students from Trinity who are studying A-level Geography and will be chaired by Councillor Scott Patient, who is the Cabinet Member for Climate Change and Resilience. Tackling the climate emergency is a key priority for our generation, so let's hand over to the panel. <laughs> Thank you. Is this on? Um, thank you very much for coming. And while the um, panel get themselves seated, um, I'll just say a little few words about the climate emergency and what's happening in Calderdale, really. It's really fitting that the youth um, panel here are speaking about this in particular because young people in Calderdale are really leading the way when it comes to um, tackling the climate emergency from Jude Walker, who famously walked to London in aid of uh, raising awareness of the carbon tax, to our own Will Solomon, who's um, been key and instrumental in developing the um, ACE Awards for schools, um, and not least as well, the, the um, Todmud and Climate College students, who have um, already the first cohort have had their graduation and the second are close to come. So um, really proud to be hosting this. Hopefully um, we can get some really interesting answer some of the questions that you've put forward and then throw it out to you at the end so be prepared questions are coming so um i wonder if i could ask abby this first question um and it's specifically around climate anxiety really um and everything that you have to deal with being a teenager anyway but i just wondered how does climate anxiety affect you sorry um <laughs> Could have done with the microphone. Um, so for the first time in 4.6 billion years, um, single species, us, have been the primary agent in um, ecological and geological change. So that is a huge thing. And the fact that we are the center of that just proves the impact that we are having. And we completely, as youth, the people who will grow into this generation have the right to be anxious about this. Um, and the Paris Agreement in 2015, that was the very focal point of the um, climate change, um, where the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark was kind of established. And um, this was a huge thing because the IPCC, the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they established that 2.5 degrees Celsius, if we continue, I'm sure it's 2030, if we don't like stop releasing carbon, that will, we will get to 2.5 degrees Celsius and it's just astronomical. Thank you. Um, oh gosh, very loud. You're so right and I think 
we see in Calderdale that we're kind of on the front line of the climate emergency or the flooding that we have, um, or the moorland fires, all a direct consequence of changing temperatures throughout the year. So I know it's a really difficult thing. My, my children have the same issues and really want action now. So it's kind of incumbent of us to make sure that we act and act quickly, really. I um, wonder if I could ask Lewis, um, yeah, um, what, why do you think, so different to my generation, why do you think your generation sees things differently? Um, what, what, what is it about that in specifically? Um, well, I do think that is quite a good question, but to give a short answer, I don't really think that our generation does see it differently. I feel like there's been a lot of climate activists sounding the warning for decades about this thing and making, sh making sure that there's a real and conscious effort to warn us of the dangers of climate change and helping us to see its significance because some well sometimes i do think it can be quite dangerous to think in terms of generations because we forget that we're all building on the shoulders of giants and that our understanding today is undeniably linked to the knowledge and actions of everyone who have come before us but i can definitely see why a question like that can arise because our generation does seem to be more aware and active on environmental issues with things like the climate strikes and other youth driven movements for example having been really inspiring not just for us but for every, every generation being impacted by the climate crisis today. In part, I feel like this could be down to the power of social media with activists like Greta Thunberg and Vanessa Nicarte, just to name a few, who have used digital technologies effectively to be able to convey the significance of the enhanced greenhouse effect. But as well, I think another part is down to the fact that our generation is the first to so obviously be living with the climate threat. For previous generations, it was largely a crisis for the future, something that would probably happen but, but the impacts of which would be felt at some undefinable point in time, years from now. But that's not what the climate crisis is for us. I think it's here, and it's definitely real. <laughs> because we've watched in recent weeks as northern Pakistan and India have endured, he endured heat waves with temperatures hitting 51 degrees Celsius, so scorching that birds have been falling dead out of the sky from dehydration. We've watched Antarctica lose 152 billion metric tons of mass year on year since 2002, and Greenland's ice sheet lose an astonishing 252 billion metric tons in that same time frame. And we've watched as sea levels rise due to feedback loops, causing annual coastal flooding in cities like Miami and across, and across the Pacific Island nation of Kiribati, which has had to purchase 200 square kilometers of land in Fiji to rehouse climate refugees as rising tides inundate their homes and culture to cultural traditions. So I think for our generation, therefore, the climate emergency isn't something we're uncertain about. It isn't something that we don't know the starting date for. Instead, it's something that's here with us now and that's already altering lives around the world. And I think that means for our generation, there's no longer any excuses for inaction. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you'll all agree that's a powerful and sort of very considered response and really throws into relief what's happening, not just in Colorado, but kind of around the world. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we've kind of touched upon what's happening already, but um, I wonder if I could ask Hayda, um, what climate impacts do you expect to see in your lifetime? Well, as we've already discussed, there are plenty of climate emergency impacts already with us. And we should be absolutely clear, these impacts were pre predictable and potentially preventable. The UN first gathered the governments of the world to discuss climate change back in 1992, which was 30 years ago. Since then, our emissions have only continued to rise. That's three decades of inaction that has brought us to where we are now. We know some of the impacts that we can expect to see in the near future. Continued alterations of weather patterns leading to more extreme weather. Locally for us here in Colorado, that would mean periodic increases in rainfall increasing our risk of flooding and also much warmer summer temperatures. Whilst the, pros, whilst the press loves to put photos of beach going tourists on the cover to celebrate warm weathers, we know that the kind of temperatures we're looking at are going to increase risks of heat related illness, especially amongst the most vulnerable, vulnerable groups, the youngest and the elderly. 
Yeah, <laughs> We're also going to see the continued dying of out of natural species in all likelihood. We're living through the sixth mass, mass extinction. A peer review study published in the Cambridge Philosophical Society's journal Biological Reviews earlier this year suggested that the biodiversity that makes our world so fascinating, beautiful, and functional is vanishing, unnoticed at an unprecedented rate. In 2019, the Bramble Cay mosaic tail rat was officially declared extinct, the first creature to have been made extinct directly by the climate crisis. When, it, when its home island of Bramble Cay in the Great Barrier Reef was inundated by sea level rise. It's the first, but it, cert won't, it certainly won't be the last. But there's a lot of difficulties for scientists when it comes to working out future impacts, because there's simply too many uncertain fe feedback mechanisms. Although we can model predicted future changes, we can't know for sure the rate at which ice sheets might collapse or permafrost melts or how these changes might alter other parts of Earth's system. For, ex for instance, as the Greenland ice sheet melts, how will this affect the salinity and temperatures of the North Atlantic Ocean? If the changes here are significant enough, we could see major changes to weather patterns in Europe if the Gulf Stream is interrupted. When, if at all, will the Amazon rainforest pass its own tipping point, whereby deforestation reaches such an extent that there's no longer enough evapotranspiration to power the car systems that provide water for the forest? If we reach this point, the rainforest could, uh, the rainforest could collapse, and then we're unclear how this might impact the rate of increase of carbon in the atmosphere. Then, there's the biggest uncertainty of all. Will we finally begin, uh, begin to take the serious action needed to reduce the impacts of the climate emergency? If we do that, then there's still hope that we might lessen some of the worst impacts. Brilliant. Brilliant, thank you. And we're seeing um, in, in our own borough as well, um, some of the impacts that the Industrial Revolution had on our landscape in terms of peatland bog. Um, and it's really important that we manage that restoration. And I think there's definitely the energy and drive to, to do that. So moving on to a different level, it's important that we reflect on some of the damage and concerns that the climate emergency is causing. But I wonder if I could ask Maisie, what gives you climate hope? Climate hope. It's an interesting concept, isn't it? Putting together two seemingly contradictory things, the climate crisis and optimism. As we've already mentioned, there are lots of justifiable reasons that people might feel climate anxiety. And we don't think anything's to be gained by telling people that they should be hopeful, or that if we keep faith in the status quo, then it'll all work out in the end. There's no place for these kinds of platitudes if we're going to build a livable world for future generations. Some would like us to take hope from new technologies too. There's this idea that we can geoengineer our way out of this world, that all we need is to develop machines to suck carbon out of the air and everything will be okay. Again, this is a fallacy, and it's a dangerous fallacy too, because it allows us to believe that we can carry on behaving as we do at the minute, letting technology do the work of stopping the climate crisis without us making any of the necessary changes to our lifestyles or economic systems. To see how much of a fallacy this is, we only need to look at carbon capture and storage, still hailed by some, including the UK government, as a technology to save us all. It is still only in use in one location, Boundary Dam Power Station in Canada, and there it is around half as effective as it was intended to be. If, as the IPCC suggests, we only have around eight years left to get emissions down, we simply can't wait for these supposedly miraculous technologies to come online. We've got to start taking action now. What we need is change, new ideas, new policies, new systems, and it's the pursuit of these that can give us hope. We've already referred to the new generation of climate activists, the likes of Greta Thunberg and Vanessa Nakata, but there are countless thousands of others, the names of whom we don't know, who are actively working to build a better future. There's hopes in these movements for change and in the ways that they're already pushing governments to take the climate emergency more seriously than they were previously. We also take hope from nature-based solutions and we have some really innovative examples of these locally. Groups like Tree Responsibility and Slow the Flow are doing amazing things to harness biodiversity, increase tree planting and manage the risk of present and future flooding. We take great hope from these kinds of initiatives too. Thank you. It's a great answer and great to give a shout out to Tree Sponsibility and Slow the Flow. We all know how fantastic they are. I um, wonder if I could ask you, Harry, um, what have you done as an individual or group to take climate action? 
And who would you like to specifically see more action from yourself? Well, one thing that I have chosen to do is study geography at A-level and hopefully at a degree level in the near future. The fact that geography not only gives us a comprehensive understanding of the climate emergency in studying topics such as water and carbon cycles, but also enlightens us to the societal context that are often forsaken is why I believe the subject is pivotal to taking action against the climate crisis. We discuss how the climate crisis can be thought of as a hazard, and we read the works of geographers like Elan Kelman, who has taught us that hazards are not natural events, but are instead consequences of long-standing slow violence against people and communities through social, political and economic decision-making, ensuring the deprived stay vulnerable. We look at the double-edged swords of urbanisation and globalisation, which are both causing the climate emergency, as well as helping to create a sustainable future for us and the planet. Ensuring that we have a population that is both educated and driven is crucial when thinking, when, when thinking about how we can save off a mass extinction event. I have recently participated in an organisation called Bright Green Future, who are fighting to make the environmental sector more diverse. I think that this scheme genuinely changed me as a person. I have always cared about the environment and it can be disheartening what, when we know the inexorable damage that the climate crisis will inflict on billions of people, yet the world around you seems not to care. But attending the residential as part of Bright Green Future, I have, I have understood that people do care and I am not the only person who is willing to dedicate their life to minimising the effects of climate change. Now, that may seem irrelevant, <laughs> however, it is my belief that through sharing experiences and connecting with the wider world that we can build communities, and through those communities we can spread knowledge and thereby power. From my point of view, by tackling the social barriers that many face, we can allow people from minority backgrounds to have a say in how we run the country and to give us the opportunity to be the ones making decisions about how, about how we should continue to develop without killing the planet and people in the process. Thank you so much for that and really good that you touched upon equality of opportunity for everyone and I've met your geography teacher and it you're definitely in safe hands. Um, so finally Neve, um, what one thing would you like everyone listening to this talk to do on climate? Um, well, what an interesting question to finish on. And to be honest, we don't think it's fair for us to have to tell people one thing to do. We don't think it's right to settle into the idea that the climate crisis can be tackled by individuals or lawmakers, small changes. And we certainly don't think it's fair to have to tell people in this room whose circumstances and personalities we know mostly nothing about what they should do to help tackle the climate emergency. And so with that in mind, I think what we would like you to take away from this is to just take it seriously, to read about it, research into the science, the causes and impacts of it, and don't be too put off by climate anxiety. When you're going to the store and trying to figure out things to buy, where you're going on holiday, how to travel, make sure you take into account the climate crisis. Even when voting for local politicians, make sure you're supporting those who are working to change the world and put pressure on those who aren't. The more of us who take the climate crisis seriously and the more we talk to people about it and try and make serious changes then the more likely we are to get the people in power who are going to do something to make a change the situation is now far beyond one where we can resolve the climate emergency by changing our light bulbs or not buying bananas we need to think seriously about the ways of our economy and society work at a bigger level but there's great hope and potential on excitement in this what better way to fight climate anxiety than by taking the causes seriously and working together to try and change the world Thank you, thank you. Um, some really wise words there. Um, finally, um, I think Charlotte, you're going to go and um, move into the audience, aren't you, and ask you guys some questions. So I hope you're ready. You need this one. Um, having listened to us speak, what do you sorry? Um, what do you think you can all do to address the climate emergency? Yeah. 
coaches, put pressure on to our former former prime minister to do more instead of him letting all those people public and that just let our world go to pieces. But yeah, we you need to we all need to act. We all we definitely all need to put pressure onto onto our government to do more instead of just standing there and saying, all right, we'll put more taxes on petrol and fuel, instead of them him blaming us for all these carbon emissions, it needs to, like, say, instead of having, like, petrol and stuff like that, we need more electric, like, electric cars and that. It'll cut down a lot on the CO2 emissions. One of our best local resources for storing carbon is our local peat moorlands. Peat moorlands are one of the UK's biggest carbon sink. And what do you think we could all do to better protect these? Um, maybe stop uh, eating pheasant and grouse and just sort of accepting that, you know, some that we don't want to support that. Um, that industry. Um, I think, sorry, just in answer to that question, I think when we're, if we're walking on the hills, that we are mindful of um, the, the peat and the landscape and we're not being irresponsible in terms of, you know, people discarding cigarettes and leaving rubbish all that sort of thing, because, you know, uh, a lot of the moors around here are, are, are destroyed, well, partly destroyed every single year by irresponsible behaviour of people. And um, I think we just want people just to act more responsibly. Thank you. Hello. I think we should tax the landowners basically. Um, there's some brilliant campaigns on at the moment, um, such as Ban the Burn and the campaigns that the RSPB are doing to protect peat moorlands, um, specifically around the persecution of birds of prey as well. So that's another way of getting people maybe into campaigning to protect these peat moorlands, is to look at the vast biodiversity and the amazing array of wildlife that are up there um, as well. Why do you think it has taken so long for us to take the climate emergency seriously? Um, so I work in digital inclusion. And I think that it's taken us so long because we have not been so connected to the world since we have, since social media and massive internet capabilities have been available and um, social media is one of the massive biggest things to help social change and give a voice to the voiceless so i think that's why it's taken so long and i think that's why we should have responsible use of social media and why it shouldn't be disregarded because it can actually change the world Hi, um, I think most people, if they were asked whatever age, would admit they find it hard to change and they probably don't even want to change. Uh, and I find it very interesting how many people uh, will stand on a stage or stand in front of a group and talk about change uh, and yet they themselves find it very difficult to change or don't want to change or impossible. So until we learn how to change uh, and we know that the changes we're going to make are for the better rather than causing other problems which we may not be able to deal with. The big question is how are we going to move forward? Thank you. Until we can uh, people can raise their voices and drown out the lobbying that comes from the very large uh, businesses that depend on us continuing matters as usual, 
then we're, we're not going to get, get our political uh, decision makers to change the pattern. Considering making explo exploitation of natural gas in the North Sea to be relabeled as a green investment opportunity is just one of these. The Guardian last week published a list of large petrochemical companies that are planning to continue huge exploitations of the, of the remaining uh, petrochemical deposits across the world until their voices can be drowned out by the voices of normal people, then we're on a hiding to nothing. People should stop dropping litter. Excuse me, sorry. I just wanted to give an example of how how difficult it is to make um, choices uh, to change. Um, so I'm traveling to Croatia in the summer. And so we have decided to travel by train there, me and my partner and my son. And it's costing us, I think, £1,600 return compared with flights on Ryanair, which were £72. And I think there's something, I mean, it's, it goes back to the where is the power and how affordable are the choices. And that's a much, much bigger issue. And I'm in a really privileged, privileged position where I can afford to make that choice. But I think everybody should be able to kind of think about traveling and seeing the world. And that's not an affordable choice for most people. And that, you know, so we've got to start thinking about how do we make transport and public transport genuinely affordable so that people can, can do what I'm doing, which is have a lovely train journey across Europe. But, you know, I know that's not realistic for most people. Um, finally, does anyone have any ideas about how we can get local communities more involved against the fight of climate change? Okay. Anybody? No? Nope. Over to you again. Um, I wanted to reiterate Chan's point, which kind of works to that question. Um, that it's about making things more affordable for people who can't afford. So if local communities, fast fashion is one of the biggest um, polluters in the entire world and they're one of the biggest people who are putting uh, pollution into the earth. So maybe what local communities can do is run classes on how to change fashion and how to get fashion from charity shops and make them work for trendy pieces and people that can afford to shop sustainably and can afford to travel sustainably should give a voice to people who can't and should boycott big fast fashion brands and shop locally um, so that people who can't afford and have to shop fast fashion they will be forced to make a change not the people sorry that are shopping the actual brands <laughs> okay um that's it thank you I just want to thank charlotte and all the youth climate panel go out there change the world make a change and hopefully it's given you some thoughts to take with you and, and some opportunities for action thank you everyone thank you councillor patient and the the students from uh, trinity sixth form academy and to you all for those very um thought-provoking questions we're now going to uh, move on to uh, our next section um I said uh, at the beginning that I've worked for the council for quite a number of years. And one of the great things about working for Calderdale Council is that I'm working with some really innovative and creative colleagues. But I've also had the chance of working with a lot of um, organizations from the voluntary sector and the private sector in Calderdale and with schools and academies. And it, it's been inspirational to me to see the innovation and the creativity that we do have in Calderdale. And this next film really exemplifies that because it is all about homegrown talent in Calderdale. 
Trinworth is one of the largest factual companies outside of London. Uh, we make for all the major broadcasters, uh, Sky, BBC, Channel 4, Channel 5. It's basically my remit to go out and find new talent and nurture that talent and bring new people into the company. I might be biased, but I do think that the people of West Yorkshire bring a unique perspective and I love working with them. We're seeing a lot more production being made in and that's kind of resulted in a, a domino effect of more people realising that they can actually build a career in media and television in the north. So we're able to use much more local crews on our shows which is, is great news for us really. There's lots of opportunities for young people. If you've got that passion to tell stories and work in the media or you love camera work or you love editing, it doesn't really matter what your background is, you just need to show that you've got the enthusiasm and, uh, and you'll knock on the door. I'm Abigail Houseman and I am the Senior Coordinator for the Beyond Brontes, the Mayor's Screen Diversity Programme. Beyond Brontes has been a programme since 2019, but in 2021 we were afforded some money to continue the programme from the Mayor's new creative deal, so it's a training programme for people who want to get into the screen industries but don't quite know how. We're open to anyone who's aged between 18 and 30 in the West Yorkshire region, which includes Calderdale. It can feel nepotism based or London based, especially I know that people worry that it, you have to move out um, of the region in order to get work and find work. But actually, we've got a thriving industry up here. There is more regional production happening. I'd say you don't have to move out and don't let that be a barrier stopping you. But we've got so many talented people. It's really exciting time to be working with them and hopefully helping them into the industry. What people are really looking for is the unexpected. And I think the people of Calderdale can really bring that to the fore sometimes might feel quite difficult to know where to start. Um, that's sort of what we here at Screen Yorkshire and what all the production companies around West Yorkshire are here to help help people discover. I'm Laurie Sanson from Northern Broadside Theatre Company based here in Halifax. Over the last few years we've been making much more work here in the town and in Calderdale in general, including two years ago. We managed to make a dance theatre piece uh, in collaboration with the Peace Hall with 20 young people and that was the beginning really of us working much more intensively with young people locally. The piece was called The Aftermath and it was co-created by the young people themselves about their experiences of being in lockdown, you know, at a such a formative moment in their life and we performed it here to a socially distanced uh, audience outdoors. We've actually appointed one of the young people who uh, was in the aftermath and in the Young Writers Forge onto our art squad and that's made up of professionals from across the country. Whatever your experience or background, know that there is a place for you. You need to demand a space within it and if it's your passion and if it's something you really believe in and it's something that really drives you, then there is absolutely no reason why you can't make that a career. I'm Rebecca Fozard and I'm the creative producer at Hebden Bridge Arts and until recently we were known as Hebden Bridge Arts Festival which is how most people will still think of us. We wanted to reach a wider range of people and hopefully reach more people who haven't engaged with the arts before or haven't had the opportunity. One of the things I think is really important for us is the positive side effects of being involved in the arts and creativity. And one of the things we've been doing this year is focusing on mentoring young people um, at Rastrick High School uh, by sharing stories of people who've got their professional lives firmly centred in, in the creative industries and the arts and showing people that you don't have to lose those aspirations to make music or to perform or to create art. I might be really well connected to lots of artists and makers because of my job but you know your average 15 year old might not know anybody who's actually successfully making a living from, from something they're passionate about. We'll let them tell us what they're interested in exploring and then we will we'll help them find someone that can help them realise those dreams. I'm Joanne Wen, I'm the Executive Director at IOU based in Halifax, West Yorkshire. Sometimes we work with young people in the actual making of the exhibition or installation. And we have a programme called Space Time Tools Advice where we give young artists and emerging artists 
support here at our studio in Halifax. And we welcome applications from young people. If they're trying to develop an idea, then they can come in and um, develop that with us. And from that process, we often spot new emerging talent. Well, there's a lot of talent in Calderdale, and I think it's really diverse and coming from all different walks of life. And that's what's exciting about it. It's about creating opportunities for young people within arts and hospitality. And then it's also about us being able to run some of our creative workshops in that space. I'm Helen Meller, co-director of uh, Arvon's Yorkshire Writing House, Lumbank, here in West Yorkshire, which used to be the home of the Poet Laureate, Ted Hughes, and is now a writing centre where we run creative writing courses for schools and adults throughout the year. We have an epidemic of, of mental health challenges to be faced by our young people exacerbated by covid and one of the most simplest forms of releasing some of that tension is right it's about just finding an outlet for people one of the things we say here is if possible leave your phones behind switch off and also you know being out here you can just say sorry connection's really rubbish you know just allow your imagination to flow in Hebden Bridge and the Valley, there are lots and lots of extremely talented writers. And it's really inspiring for young people to see somebody living and working locally and then coming to teach them. And they think, hang on a minute, that could be me. And that, that coupled with this extraordinary landscape, I, is a very, very inspiring place to be. And I feel very privileged to be part of that and to inspire the next generation. So as was said there, there is a lot of opportunity for the creative arts in Calderdale and we're really proud of that. Um, we're now going to move on to our, our next panel, um, which is uh, the coming together to collaborate, innovate and inspire panel. And joining me on the stage, I'd like you to welcome Rachel Dilley, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Town Hall Dental Group. Um, and that's an organization who are passionate advocates of corporate social responsibility and being a disability confident employer, giving opportunities to those from disadvantaged communities or challenging circumstances. So welcome, Rachel. I'd also like to invite Don Furby, who is the uh, Deputy Chief Executive of Calderdale Smart Move uh, to the stage. That's a charity uh, supporting the homeless and the vulnerably housed, um, which also works with businesses across Calderdale to educate people about the work of the charity and also help clients directly. So welcome, Don. And I also have pleasure in welcoming uh, Laura Wilby, who is Associate Director at Caravan Guard, a family-owned local leisure insurance specialist, which has been an active fundraiser for many, many years, with their staff taking part in many challenges and activities to raise money for worthy causes right through the pandemic. So welcome, Laura. Now, fingers crossed, because um, we're also going to be joined, hopefully, virtually by Ken Barnsley, who is a public health consultant and an advocate of age-friendly Calderdale, where organisations work together to help people age healthily and safely by making changes so they can continue to live independently and actively. So welcome to you, Ken. Good to see you. Hopefully these work. Yep, hopefully we're on. Right, okay, welcome panelists uh, to this um, second panel of the day. We do have some uh, questions which have been sent in um, before this event. And I'm going to start, Dom, if I may, with yourself. Um, and the question is, have you found issues faced by tenants uh, uh, and the issues that uh, are raised in the question are things like um, appropriateness of the accommodation or the quality of the accommodation and the responsiveness of um, 
of landlords. Have you found these issues faced by tenants have been compounded by social stigma of homelessness? Hopefully this works, yeah, it does. <laughs> um, I'm quite lucky, obviously, I work for Coldale Smart Move. Prior to that, I was in West Yorkshire Fire Service for 25 years. Um, we were very reactive in the fire service. Um, we worked a lot with our councillors. We worked with um, a lot of agencies, and we would go to fires and things like this where properties weren't um, appropriate. Um, and I know our local MP here, Holly, very caring, was one of those people that contacted us a few years ago when we had a property that wasn't safe. Now, working for a charity is very different. Obviously, many, many years ago, charities were just an add-on in any society. Um, but now a charity in any organisation, if it's mental health, if it's to do with what I do, we work with the homeless and vulnerable, um, it's a necessity. We absolutely are needed in every community across this country. And the properties that we work with, we work with private landlords and we work with um, social housing. And it's really important that people who go into those properties feel safe and they can move into that house and then make it into a home. Now, a lot of our clients, when they come to us, have been either moved out of a property, have lived in on the street, have come out of prison, have fled domestic violence or, or come from another country. And it's really important that the people that we work with and the clients that we work with, when they move into that property, they've got everything that we all expect ourselves: Gas, electricity, utilities are, are, are working, are safe. So initially when obviously COVID started, um, it was really hard because obviously the government and the councils made sure that people were in the kept in their properties. Certain things have changed now. And it's really important that the clients that we work with still have that security to live in that property. Um, so we have a, um, a, a gentleman um, who works with our landlords and with social housing. And prior to anybody moving into that property, we make sure that, that property is safe. And, and it's not just about making sure that all the, the, the utilities, everything there is safe. It's making sure that it's safe for that person to live in that area as well. So it's, we're really fortunate in Calderdale. And I know that the councillors are here, but we are really lucky because we all talk to each other. I've worked in f every district when I was in the fire service. Calderdale is a very, very special place. We all pick up the phone and we actually talk to people face to face. And if there is a problem, we try and sort it out there and then. So what I'll say to, to obviously, it's a, I've, I've gone around the, the mills a little bit, but we talk to each other and we make sure if there's a problem, we get things done. And the good thing about Calderdale, we have people like Rachel, like Laura, like all the companies. And if you do need, if you're a charity, if you do need something doing, there's always people there that will put their hand up and help you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Dom. That's fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so Rachel, you've got the microphone, so I'll ask you the next one, if that's okay. Um, question for you then, Rachel. How important is it for your organisation to give opportunities to those from challenging circumstances? Um, myself, I have um, a very rare genetic condition, but I've never let it define who I am. Um, and through um, our, our group, I wanted to set up and give back to our community, but particularly to those people that wouldn't be given the opportunities in other businesses. We have our own disability program within the group. Um, we have we give opportunities to people that have cerebral palsy, that are autistic, that have dyslexia. But what we don't do is we don't focus on the disability. We focus on the abilities, which is really important. We allow them to um, have their own career path and achieve their goals in where they want to be. Uh, you know, two of my dental nurses have won UK Dental Nurse of the Year, but I've seen their own abilities and not the disability. We also have um, our own apprenticeship program, which again is really important. It's being able to give that desire to the younger people to be able to achieve what they want through their career. Brilliant. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Rachel. 
Okay, so um, if I may, I'm going to go over to you, Ken, um, on screen for the next question, if that's okay. Um, as a community, how can we make Calderdale streets more welcoming for older people? Hi, good morning to you all. Yeah, um, thanks very much. That's a, that's a really important question. Um, and as we, as we age, um, we have issues in terms of mobility, possibly in terms of our vision and our memory, which makes it really important that our streets are safe and secure. Uh, it's important to have really good quality public transport, somewhere to sit and access to clean uh, public toilets. And in our approaches, we're trying to make sure that our pavements are safe, that we've got active uh, and effective street lighting, and that we're starting to reduce the fear of crime. And the, the kind of the real reasons to improve all of those things are twofold. One is to, to make sure that we've got uh, inclusive communities and that they're all connected together and we enable people to establish better connections with, uh, with communities and with places as well. But there's also an issue about economic vibrancy. We want to uh, encourage all of our population and particularly our older people and communities to, to make good use of our high streets. We've got a couple of really good opportunities across Calderdale and uh, you know, like the rest of the panel, I'm, I'm really impressed with the, the film that we've just seen in relation to creativity uh, and creativity driving inclusion and connectedness. But we've got two great opportunities in the Togmaden and uh, Brig House town deals where investment is coming in to improve those places. And, you know, as part of our age-friendly strategy, we're looking to ensure that those developments ensure that both of those places are age-friendly as well. So a couple of things that, um, that are really important is one is working towards age-friendly status. So this is a major recommendation from the World Health Organization to improve places, improve communities and improve town centers is working towards age-friendly status. And we're fully signed up to doing that along with our partners uh, across all of the public agencies and the community and voluntary sector as well. And in the middle of that, it's, we've, we've identified and we've signed up to making sure that we listen to all the people and invest in those age-friendly communities and enable people to have a voice in all of that. So that all the work that we're doing is, is designed with our older people and communities and not designed necessarily for them. And we're trying to make it inclusive in terms of social inclusiveness and also digital inclusiveness. We realise the pace uh, at which technology is moving along and it's absolutely rapid as uh, the technology just to enable me to speak to you today although i do feel like i'm looming in the corner a little bit um but um that that technology is a massive opportunity to, to improve things in terms of connectedness and in terms of access to high streets and all the things that they're going to be and finally i think it's important to have inclusive design um we're just in the process of uh, updating and developing our local plan for the place um, and I think it's important to make sure that we recognize that our population is aging uh, you know in the next two three five ten twenty years the population is going to be older and that we need to design for the future and that will encourage our residents our older people to make really good use of our high streets and keep them vibrant that's brilliant thanks Ken Thank you for that. So, uh, Laura, over to you, seeing you've got the uh, microphone. You see, it hasn't just been thrown together, this panel. It's, it's, <laughs> it's been choreographed, don't worry. Um, Laura, your organisation, um, you, you've sponsored you've sponsored Hannah Cockcroft, you've sponsored Overgate Hospice. How in, important is it, uh, from your point of view, to give back to the community? Uh, well, the short answer is very. Um, certainly the main part of my role at Caravan Guard is to implement the um, corporate social responsibility policy that we have. Um, I'd say that um, things like um, Overgate, um, obviously uh, my father-in-law set the company about 40 years ago um, and not long after um, that we lost a close family member um, who received care at Overgate. So that became something that they were, uh, their family wanted to help with and do what we could. And that takes all sort of forms, such as sponsoring um, a marketing and development officer for themselves to um, generate more income. 
Um, the colour runs a great one because um, not only does it help Overgate raise loads of money, um, but from our point of view, it gives us a great opportunity for staff engagement. Um, the one that's coming up in July, we've already got a team of eight people ready to throw paint at the runners and uh, countless other um, staff members and their own families taking part in the run as well. Um, again, same with Hannah. Um, Hannah came about because she was writing to local companies when she first started out and um, the letter landed on um, Peter's desk, my father-in-law, and he straight away said absolutely and that relationship's continued and Hannah's great, she comes back to us all the time to say thank you, um, which also helps for staff, um, there's not very many people that can say they've had a breakfast brunch with a Paralympian and a selfie with the uh, gold medals around the neck. So yeah, it, it's very important, definitely. Fantastic, thanks very much, Laura. It's nice to hear. I had the pl pleasure of working with Hannah Cockcroft at last year's We Are Calderdale, which we did virtually. And she said she wanted to get into uh, kind of broadcasting and stuff like that so I said I'd give her some tips if she wanted <laughs> joking by the way I'm joking okay so Dom can I can I ask you to take the microphone and another question for you is what what's the best way in your opinion in Calderdale that we can help the homeless community well what a question um we'll have all seen more homeless people uh, we'll all be aware of somebody that's homeless or vulnerable and I think the, the thing is it's not to just use that that strap line as homeless because it's the vulnerability uh, there's more and more families out there individuals that have all come under the vulnerable bracket we work closely with schools we work closely with partner agencies um, a lot of fantastic charities in Calderdale one focus for hope where you work very close with Rachel we work with um, companies as well we've got a link with post office who actually now if there's anybody they see anybody that's homeless they will report back to us as a charity we are very fortunate that we can spread our wings quite wide um, and we go across the whole of Caldwell and not just across the whole of Caldwell I think the big big word that we all use and when I was in the fire service we all used it quite a lot is prevent and prevent um, people get made, being homeless um, the people probably you tend, tend to see on the streets in Calderdale are generally the, the street beggars. They're not generally the ones that are actually homeless. The people that are actually homeless are the ones that are hidden away, the ones that are sleeping on people's sofas, the ones that are sleeping in the car. We had a gentleman called Andy that lived in a caravan up at near Robert Shaw's for five years, and he was at the lowest point of his life before he actually turned to us for help, but nobody knew him. He walked into town every single morning for five years and then walked every back every night to his caravan and I went to see him and now Andy is living in a flat he's got a job he's got friends and things like this he did have an addiction problem but he's now with the support from all the other agencies that we've got got cross Calderdale he's now stopped so I think it's preventing first and as a charity going for 24 years I've only been there four years you need the partnerships across the country across the county to work together closely um, and, and I think that's the way forward. It's about us talking to each other. It's about working with the council who are very caring within Calderdale. Obviously, the resources are not there as they used to be, but as a charity, we are able to go out and reach out more and more. But I think it's more important that we talk to each other and, and, and get to the root cause why people are becoming homeless. It's really getting hard at the moment, as we all know. People are struggling. And I, I had a, a conversation prior you know to us to us sitting here um that people are really struggling and it's not just the people that you generally think the ones that are drug dependents the ones that are alcoholics the people with mental health issues it's a normal person on the street now that are really struggling and it's really important that we we communicate and prevent those people getting even worse and if you do see people we are lucky we've got some amazing teachers that come to us mungo here who we know who works in a fantastic area but the teachers are really important that they communicate to charities like ourselves but also the other agencies that are working really hard to prevent people from becoming homeless. So I think the big thing is, is the prevent and it's all talking properly. That's great, Dom, thank you. So um, I'd like to just keep on that theme and, and pass back to uh, Ken, if I may. And on this, on this issue of communication, one of the questions is, um, how do we ensure that people, particularly elderly people, 
don't go weeks without speaking to someone. And this is about Calderdale being an age friendly borough um, and, and older people leading socially fulfilled lives. What, what's, what's your take on that, Ken? Uh, I think the first thing I'd probably say is that I mean we've just we're just coming through the uh, COVID pandemic and coming out the other side. And one of the things that I think it's really good to recognise is that there's been some fantastic work during the during the pandemic in terms of the community and voluntary organisations across Calderdale working really hard to make sure that people are included uh, and you know food parcels, befriending schemes, all of those sorts of things. Um, we do know, though, that we've got 40,000 people in the borough, more than 40,000, age 65 plus. Uh, 11,000 of those live on their own. Uh, and loneliness is um, the kind of the, the, the big disease for, the, for, our, for our times. Um, and it has major implications on people's health. So I think the thing that we will continue to do is to continue to work with uh, our partners uh, we've just established our health and wellbeing strategy, which has a really innovative uh, policy objective, which is to ensure that older people have strong social networks and live in vibrant communities. Now, if we think about previous policies and strategies, which looked at specifically reducing particular disease, this is a really innovative, innovative ambition, and uh, all of our partners are getting behind that. And what we're wanting to do is to make sure that local environments encourage people to, to be active, to get out and about, to make connections in their communities. So improving local green space, making it safe and accessible, uh, improving our community facilities, and particularly you know, some of the things that we've seen in the, in the film about uh, enhancing the provision of arts and things for people to do and places for people to go. Uh, and a fundamental to all of that is age-friendly housing. Uh, Age-friendly housing enables people to have a safe base uh, and from to, to develop out from there. Now, obviously, within our partnership, we realise it's not quite as simple as that, uh, and that loneliness, uh, and we've identified through national studies that more than 40% of older people feel that the television is their only friend. Now, that is quite a, a shocking statistic for me and something that we really need to do something about. But our approach is to be working with those partners, community and voluntary sector, um, enhancing those befriending schemes, developing the initiatives that public health has in terms of staying well and working with those communities, encouraging people to be active uh, and to get out and about. And that's supported by the, the work that we've done in talking to all people and communities across the borough. But their big issues are accessibility to places, places to, to socialise and things to do, they want a feeling of safety and belonging. They want reliable and connected public transport. So that's a critical issue and really important that West Yorkshire has just received some uh, significant chunk of resources to enhance and improve public transport. And then finally, as, as I identified, age-friendly housing. So all of those are part of our strategy to improve things and reduce social isolation and loneliness for our older people. That's great. Thank you, Ken. That's wonderful. Well, I think... We, I'm just getting the signal that unfortunately we're out of time. So I, I would like to thank yourself, Ken, for joining us, to Laura, to Dom, and also to Rachel for joining this panel. There's some really good stuff that's come out of there, and it's, it's encouraging the amount of work that is happening in Calderdale at the moment. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much to the panel, that was quite interesting. Moving on, we have lots more fantastic talks, discussions and performances coming up. But for now, it's time for another performance from Calderdale College. Here another, here's another Shadow Thea Pierce piece that reflects some of the work that students have been doing within the community. My name's Chris, so Cliff, I work for Caldwell Council and today I'm with the public service students from Caldwell College here at Mixenden. Uh, we're in the woodlands at Seed Hill. Uh, the group have been in a few times before and they've helped us with lots of woodland management work which includes clearing felled trees, dead trees, trees that have been blown on by the storm, cutting back on the footpath edges of the uh, nettles and brambles so people can walk through and they've also done a massive amount of litter clearance. I think we've pulled about 120 
bags out of this woodland with the students over a number of years. So their work here is, is absolutely fantastic. Hi, I'm Beth. I'm Libby. And we're doing public service with Level 3 at Calderdale College. Today we're out in the community helping out with some litter picking. We've been here a few times this year already helping clear up the community so residents can enjoy it. 1A33 take 2. Action! If you have experienced or witnessed sexual harassment on the railway, please call or email Northern and report it to the police. We got to spend the day on the railway and it was really fun. All the staff were really nice. Everyone was super helpful and the helpers get on and off the trains. I felt like we were really raising awareness for a really important issue and I hope that it helps people. Okay, whenever you're ready. Nice and loud. It's nice to spread awareness to people. In like, we saw that we touched quite a lot of people in a personal way, so that was, it was nice to see that we, ha uh, we got the message across properly. We can, like, show how different people are struggle with different things to do with mental health. Forming art group at a college and a church very different, like, groups, but the fact that we came together it just can show that a lot of people can help each other out and come together to make sure people are okay. At the end of the day, we're all a big community. Everyone needs to help out each other. So I felt it was really important for the faith communities to come together to begin a conversation about how we're going to look after one another in the coming months and years. Thank you, it was amazing. It's now time for a 30 minutes break. Feel free to wander around the marketplace just behind you where you can visit some exciting stations. place of sanctuary for me, a place of support and also a place of unity for me. Very organized, kind and helpful organization. Relaxing, uh, lovely and friendly. Help, support and community. Love, kindness and affection. I met very warm people in our city center. So from this time they like my family. When I came to Halifax, the housing manager asked me uh, to go to St. Vincent Center uh, to help me with the registration, with the GED and funding. As soon as I entered, 
was very warmly welcomed. I saw people like me laughing, smiling, and the staff of St. Augustine Center very, very welcoming. They welcomed me and my daughter. At that time, she was only three months old with kindness. One thing I would love and everyone to know about St. Augustine is that um, it's a center where you go to and get accepted. It's a center where you go to and, and, and find people that will stand in solidarity with you, people that show empathy with you, and then, you know, it's a place where you get clarification. Where we are allowed um, to hope and to dream, and we are appreciated and we are motivated to dream, to think big and to dream big and to hope for the better future for ourselves, for our family, as well as our community. I love We are Healthy Minds, offering mental health support to anyone who needs it in Calderdale. We understand that there are a range of factors that impact our well-being and that support can never be one size fits all. So we offer different services to suit different needs. Our recovery and support service provides a range of opportunities for people in Calderdale to explore different ways of looking after their own well-being, from attending peer support groups to doing dental activities such as art, walking, allotment groups, yoga and more. Safe Space offers out of hours emotional support for people in distress during evenings and weekends, open to anyone over 16, providing a listening ear when everything gets too much. Time Out, our service for young people aged 10 to 19, so there's regular free activities and workshops, ensuring kids have access to fun things to do to help them find their thing, to be happy and stay well. Urdu for Life. Roshani, a specialist mental health education project working with black and minority ethnic people to remove stigma and improve the mental health of local Bain communities. The Welfare Rights Service is a free and confidential service offering supportive and non-judgmental help with benefits, PIP claims and universal credit. Open by referral only, our LINK project works with people who often use mental health or emergency services. LINK helps people to break out of cycles of crisis and make the lasting changes that they want to achieve in their own lives. Our new community wellbeing team works across Calderdale by offering support to specific households on their doorstep. The project takes support to the heart of the community by making people aware of what is available and how they can access it. Over the past year, our Colorado Cares for Us project provided crucial support to public and voluntary sector workers. Healthy Minds has now developed this project to ensure ongoing support for sustainable workplaces and happy lives in Calderdale. Healthy Minds, here to support Calderdale's well-being. So the Outback Community Kitchen and Garden really is a project that was set up for the benefit of local people. What we want to do is provide a safe green space and a real means for people to help improve their health and well-being by being outdoors and learning more about growing food and cooking. It belongs to everybody and I think that's, that's the beauty of this place, it belongs to everybody and everybody's welcome here and it is all about well-being and I think anybody being in the natural environment the lockdown has really shown us our natural environment is absolutely pivotal to your me good mental health the fact that you can come here and be welcomed that everybody has kindness at their heart and growing and sharing food you know that's for me this is what this is about it's a sharing space to share food that's grown here I've been coming to the Outback for like a couple of years now and to be quite honest right this has been my real life server because I kid you not I wouldn't have had a life without this place. It's, it's prevented the loneliness, the total suicidal thoughts that I used to have because I, I didn't feel like I had anybody I could turn to or anywhere to go to. I love the people down here. You can come down and relax or you can come and get stuck into actually all the work that you know going on here. It just helps you to thrive. It makes you feel like you belong to something. It, it gives you um, an important role. That, that's how I see it anyway, because I, I felt that I had nothing or nowhere to turn to. I, I think coming back to work would have been quite a daunting task. 
taking into account I've been off for nearly over a year, you know, uh, I, I do suffer from anxiety myself and even in the space of what, three months, I think I've made amazing steps. Just been having the op opportunity to come out and help the other people, other staff here and engaging with the community and just being out in this green space. I, I can't really put in words uh, how, that, how much that's helped me. Uh, it's unbelievable. I'm 85 and I like to keep occupied. I've been coming about seven, maybe eight years. It's just brilliant. I've learned how to be myself again. She's brought my courage back, my confidence. I can laugh again. I'm understanding jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and I just feel like the old Tess is back. Do you know what I mean? And now I just want to be a mentor for other people and give them the encouragement and the enthusiasm that this place has actually given me. It's given me a reason to live and priceless. Welcome to Artworks, the Everybody School of Arts. I'm Lauren, I'm one of the directors. Artworks uh, is an artist-led community arts organisation. We believe that opportunity and engagement with art can make things better for everybody and should be available to all. In our building you'll find our art school where we run courses and workshops like drawing, painting or ceramics and where we host our artist in residence spaces. On our second floor we have our gallery where you find free exhibitions showing the work of um, artists and creative people, community groups, and we also hold events, meetings and talks. Our third floor is where we have our artist studios, a space where 24 artists and creative people make their work. We are based in Halifax, about a 10 to 15 minute walk from the Peace Hall or the train station, and we're based inside a former textile mill. You can find out more about the artworks on our website, by calling, emailing or by visiting us. A very social place as well as a shopping place, it's a cracking little place to be. Home, heart, soul. Yes, I've moved away and lived other places, but I've always come back. We're so lucky as a town because we've got lots of reasons to visit. One of England's best kept secrets for a very long time um, is now fast becoming a destination place. In Britain, I can't think of a town I'd rather live in than Halifax. So much going on. There's the Peace Hall, the town centre, we've got the Borough Market, Gentleman Jack, the heritage trails, the culture and the heritage and the history and the architecture, the Anne Lister and the Shivden Hall and the Minster and the Town Hall. The food festivals, through to Yorkshire. Eureka, the National Children's Museum, Square Chapel, the Industrial Museum, the wonderful indoor market. They are trying the hardest to put things back in and it's not a case of they're just doing what they want. They will come and ask you and I've actually seen them put things into place. It's a community. It plays an important role for things that wouldn't get done otherwise. It's the icing on the cake. But also just their street wardens, just walking around, bumping into them, talking to them. It's nice to see that they're always there and you get a quick response. The bid has brought an extra dimension that we've been lacking. Encouraging people to care for the environment that their businesses are in. I've been very grateful to the support I've had with events here in the Minster and actually providing people to help those go smoothly. Very, very practical, down-to-earth things. Progress, up and coming. Home. Beautiful time. Optimistic. Rejuvenated. Magic Halifax. Magic Halifax. <laughs>
This helped me gain confidence with cooking and learn valuable life skills whilst promoting my independence. I also followed easy read recipes and was soon having regular remote cooking sessions with my friend Stephen. And together we enjoyed this activity during lockdown. Well, we couldn't meet each other in person. As part of a community food project, which was being done by Verdigree Arts, my recipe for a roast dinner was included in their community cookbook called Just Eat. Learning to cook has really helped my confidence and been lots of fun sharing with friends. And then we started uh, doing some slow, slow cooking, which we did a hell of a lot of cooking. Me and Roy did a good job together. We met, we met, each, we, we went on, we did all the uh, preparing and everything. And we used, to, we used to enjoy it every Saturday morning. Me and Roy used to every Saturday morning, and we really enjoyed it. it was, I really enjoyed it myself. It was good. Hello, my name's Karen Graham and I'm the service manager for Lead the Way, which is part of Clove Leaf Advocacy. We provide an information and advice service for adults with learning disabilities and their families in Caldervale. If you would like some more information, you can contact us on 0300 012 0416. Calder Valley Community Land Trust was started by volunteers in the community. We're member based. We have over 250 members now. And this was our first development, Burke's Court. We're about meeting a need and there is a need for more accommodation for older people to enable them to live independently. That's what Burke's Court does. We are custodians of important and valued buildings in the community. Field and Hall in the background was gifted to us because we could look after it in perpetuity and keep it for community use. We used a community share issue which enabled local people to invest in the houses on the end of the hall to enable us to buy those and make them into affordable rented accommodation. The Land Trust has strong governance which enables us to partner with Connect Housing to take on asset transfers like this land from Calderdale Council. The land itself used to be home to a lot of houses but they were cleared in the 1960s. Our aim is to bring some super energy efficient homes, 20 of them in fact, back to this hillside. We're working with Network Rail to take care of the Grade 2 listed signal box in Hebden. No longer in use, but hopefully, in a short while, it will be a heritage centre and holiday accommodation. We're working with Calderdale Council to bring the two properties above the supermarket um, back into use. They've been empty a while. Um, we think they'd be great to address a need for young people's affordable accommodation, which is rare in the locality. And we're also aiming to make them super energy efficient, addressing fuel poverty and the climate change. The Climate Challenge College project was a pilot funded by the National Lottery Climate Action Fund. We designed and developed the pioneering Green Futures Sustainability Education and Skills course. The course is an introduction to sustainable building, regenerative farming, energy production and understanding and challenging the climate crisis.
We are based at Todd College in Todmorden and have a focus on building a community committed to tackling the challenges of climate change. We recruited two cohorts of students. These were people from a variety of backgrounds. Young people concerned about the future of the planet, people who have been long-term unemployed, people who have been let down by the traditional education sector, some who had wanted to pivot into environmental careers. We've also organised events and activities for the local community, including events for Todmorden High School and Hotwood Hall College. So I'm Barbara Jones, I'm the director of the School of Natural Building and I'm working here today with the Climate Challenge students and I teach them every week about natural building. So my name's Mike, um, I'm the grower and educator at Incredible Farm um, and today I'm, I'm teaching a little bit about permaculture and growing um, to the college students. At its heart, the course is all about introducing our students to the practical skills which will be needed for the sort of jobs that will exist in a future greener economy. Um, when I finished the course, I um, went on to do Kickstart with the Incredible Farm, uh, and still currently here. I'm really proud of the impact that the course has had on the lives of the individual students, but also the, just the amount of the variety that, that the course offers. So one week they might be researching renewables or learning about the soil structure and the next week they can be building a, a compost toilet from scratch. If you'd like to find out more about what we do at the college or you have any questions about the course, we'd love to hear from you so please send us an email. For a small market town, Tomadon punches above its own weight. It is the home of Incredible Edible, of Tomadon Learning Centre and Community Hub, of artists, activists, community leaders, a mix of people coming together and making positive changes. We are proud to say that we are Calderdale. This June, a new mouth-watering community food festival is coming to Halifax. Flavourfest is a month-long celebration of culture and diversity, organised by and delivered within one of the most culturally vibrant and distinctive places in Calderdale, with events and activities planned across multiple locations for people to enjoy, learn and experience a larger life. Hi, my name is Sebastian Fortuna. Uh, I'm from JFoot Feedbox, based in Halifax. Welcome to Park and Warley, or West Central Halifax, a place where the community is driving economic, social and environmental change to reduce inequalities and build an inclusive economy that brings opportunity for everyone. My name's Debbie Jagger. Um, I'm currently the owner of P. Wilkinson Bakers Limited. Me and my husband have run this business for approximately 35, 40 years. A place where you can sample cuisines from across Europe, Africa, Asia and the Middle East within one square mile walking distance where the heritage is rich and innovation and talent is nurtured within state-of-the-art facilities. And nestled in between the industrial terrace streets is a garden of paradise where people gather to grow and cook organic food and collect the honey from their own beehives. Uh, I'm Marcela, uh, uh, I'm activities coordinator at St. Augustine Centre. Uh, we are a charity uh, uh, and we support this is a place where some of the oldest businesses mix with some of the youngest and new enterprise can thrive. A unique place where new arrivals to Calderdale are welcomed with open arms and there are places and spaces where the hungry are fed, older people enjoy social activities to prevent isolation and loneliness, children receive the best start and young people are provided with opportunities to learn, have fun and develop to their full potential. So visit flavorfest.org and join us in June for a flavour of Calderdale you might not have tasted before. We are Healthy Minds, offering mental health support to anyone who needs it in Calderdale. We understand that there are a range of factors that impact our wellbeing and that support can never be one size fits all. So we offer different services to suit different needs. Our recovery and support service provides a range of opportunities for people in Calderdale to explore different ways of looking after their own well-being, from attending peer support groups to doing dental activities such as art, walking, allotment groups, yoga and more. Safe Space offers out of hours emotional support for people in distress during evenings and weekends, open to anyone over 16, providing a listening ear when everything gets too much. 
time out are service for young people aged 10 to 19 to live as regular free activities and workshops, ensuring kids have access to fun things to do to help them find their thing, to be happy and stay well. Urdu for Life, Roshani, a specialist mental health education project working with black and minority ethnic people to remove stigma and improve the mental health of local Bain communities. The Welfare Rights Service is a free and confidential service offering supportive and non-judgmental help with benefits, PIP claims and universal credit. Open by referral only, our LINK project works with people who often use mental health or emergency services. LINK helps people to break out of cycles of crisis and make the lasting changes that they want to achieve in their own lives. Our new community wellbeing team works across Calderdale by offering support to specific households on their doorstep. The project takes support to the heart of the community by making people aware of what is available and how they can access it. Over the past year, our Colorado Cares for Us project provided crucial support to public and voluntary sector workers. Healthy Minds has now developed this project to ensure ongoing support for sustainable workplaces and happy lives in Calderdale. Healthy Minds, here's to support Calderdale's wellbeing. So the Outback Community Kitchen and Garden really is a project that was set up for the benefit of local people. What we want to do is provide a safe green space and a real means for people to help improve their health and well-being by being outdoors and learning more about growing food and cooking. It belongs to everybody and I think that's, that's the beauty of this place, it belongs to everybody and everybody's welcome here and it is all about well-being and I think anybody being in the natural environment the lockdown has really shown us our natural environment is absolutely pivotal to your good mental health the fact that you can come here and be welcomed everybody has kindness at their heart and growing and sharing food you know that's for me this is what this is about. it's a sharing space to share food that's grown here I've been coming to the Outback for like a couple of years now and to be quite honest right this has been my real life server because I kid you not I wouldn't have had a life without this place. It's, it's prevented the loneliness, the total suicidal thoughts that I used to have because I, I didn't feel like I had anybody I could turn to or anywhere to go to. I love the people down here. You can come down and relax or you can come and get stuck into actually all the work that, you know, going on here. It just helps you to thrive. It makes you feel like you belong to something. It, it gives you um, an important role. That, that's how I see it anyway, because I, I, I felt that I had nothing or nowhere to turn to. I, I think coming back to work would have been quite a daunting task, taking into account I've been off for nearly over a year. You know, uh, I, I do suffer from anxiety myself, and even in the space of, what, three months, I think I've made amazing steps just been having the op opportunity to come out and help uh, the other people, all the staff here and engaging with the community and just being out in this green space. That I, I can't really put in words uh, how, that, how much that's helped me. Uh, it's unbelievable. I'm 85 and I like to keep up occupied. I've been coming about seven, maybe eight years. It's just brilliant. I've learned how to be myself again. She's brought my courage back, my confidence. I can laugh again. I'm understanding jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and I just feel like the old Tess is back. Do you know what I mean? And now I just want to be a mentor for other people and give them the encouragement and the enthusiasm that this place has actually given me. It's given me a reason to live and it's priceless. Welcome to Artworks, the Everybody School of Arts. I'm Lauren, I'm one of the directors. Artworks uh, is an artist-led community arts organisation. We believe that opportunity and engagement with art can make things better for everybody and should be available to all. In our building, you'll find our art school, where we run courses and workshops like drawing, painting or ceramics. 
and where we host our artist in residence spaces. On our second floor, we have our gallery where you find free exhibitions showing the work of um, artists and creative people, community groups, and we also hold events, meetings and talks. Our third floor is where we have our artist studios, a space where 24 artists and creative people make their work. We are based in Halifax, about a 10 to 15 minute walk from the Peace Hall or the train station, and we're based inside a former textile mill. You can find out more about the artworks on our website by calling, emailing, or by visiting us. A place of sanctuary for me, a place of support, and also a place of unity for me. Very organized, kind, and helpful organization. Relaxing, uh, lovely, and friendly. Help support and community. Love, kindness and affection. I met very warm people in our city center. So from this time they like my family. When I came to Halifax, the housing manager asked me uh, to go to San Jose Center uh, to help me with the registration, with the GB and funding. As soon as I entered, I was very warmly welcomed. I saw people like me laughing, smiling, and the staff of St. Augustine Center, very, very welcoming. They welcomed me and my daughter. At that time, she was only three months old, with kindness. One thing I've loved and everyone to know about St. Augustine is that um, it's a center where you go to and get accepted. It's a center where you go to and, and, and find people that will stand in solidarity with you people that show empathy with you and then you know is a place where you get clarification where we are allowed um, to hope and to dream and we are appreciated and we are motivated to dream to think big and to dream big and to hope for the better future for ourselves for our families as well as our communities Okay, so welcome back everybody and thanks for coming back so promptly. I hope you've uh, had a chance to have a look around the stalls in the marketplace and also have some refreshments and maybe a comfort break as well. Uh, we're now into the second part of uh, We Are Calderdale 2022 and we're going to start it with a, a film uh, entitled The Green Heart of Calderdale. We are Calderdale. We are Calderdale, a place of kindness, a place where we come together in the tough times for each other as well as the good. A place of kindness now and forever. This heart is for the amazing staff and volunteer team here at St Augustine's who work tirelessly to make sure anybody seeking sanctuary in Calderdale is cared for. And this heart is especially for one Becky Hallowell, who is at the heart of St Augustine's and has been for many years and is about to go on a six month sabbatical adventure. Becky, we wish you well. This heart is for the kindness that Calderdale has shown for people fleeing conflict from Ukraine and the rest of the world. Thank you to 
the Leo Group, thank you to St Augustine's, thank you to the Halifax Ukrainians and to Calder Community Cares and thank you to my colleagues who have pulled out all the stops to make sure that people coming to Calderdale have a warm and safe welcome here. And this is for all the people who have been supporting the vaccine programme and to all the public who have taken up the vaccine and allowed us to get back to normality. Thank you. And for Ash Green School and the wider community, for all the help and support and getting everybody back into school so speedily after the fire. And for the whole school community of Ash Green Community Primary School, the mixed in our wonderful children, parents, carers, families, and the wider community across the borough for giving us the strength to get back as quickly as we could to running our school in a fantastic way for our amazing children. Thank you. This heart is for the COVID champions and all the support they've given our communities and settings in Calderdale over the last two years. This heart's also for our contact tracers and the amazing work they've been doing to support and ensure our community stay safe throughout the pandemic. This heart is for Halifax Opportunities Trust, who support 1,700 people each day throughout the Calderdale community. This heart is for everybody who has visited Calderdale since we've reopened after the pandemic. Uh, a special thank you to all of our visitors who have been over for the fantastic Analyst of Birthday Festival, um, Analyst of Birthday Week, and of course the inaugural Analyst of Society is part of that. We had about 450 visitors, including several hundred from America uh, and across the world. Thank you to everybody and see you in Halifax and Calderdale soon. And a special mention to the Siddle sisters who crocheted models of Hannah Cockroft and Anne Lister, which went on post boxes in Halifax. Uh, so come and see those as well. Thank you. And it's for all the communities of Calderdale, the towns, the villages, the private, the public, the third sector, who've all come together to make Calderdale such a wonderful, resilient, distinctive place full of kindness. stage but uh, I, I, I don't I hope you don't blame me but I declined that very kind offer it is with us today and we, we would like to express our gratitude to Halifax Opportunities Trust for uh, producing this green heart of Calderdale uh, and, and for the lovely sentiments that were expressed in the film um, I think all we've got to do with this now is just watch this space and see where it's going next because it's a really exciting time for Calderdale and I think this green heart does, it, it really encapsulates what, what's special about Calderdale. Um, so now we're going to move on to um, a group of friends really here who are going to step up to the, the pedestal here and just say a few words about their story. Uh, and there's some real powerful experiences in, in their stories. And first, I'm going to invite Arsalan to come up to the microphone and tell us a bit about your story. Thank you. Shall I start? Yeah. The asylum system process literally means limbo. The only thing you can do in the meantime is just wait. Every single day for 18 months, the first thing I did was to go downstairs and check the letterbox. Maybe there is a letter from the home office. Unfortunately, the only thing I found was sometimes a leaflet with some fancy food and sometimes a letter that had a notice to buy a TV license. But asylum seekers can't have a TV because they are not allowed to work and struggle to manage their life on only 40 pounds per week. Think, you are here with only one set of clothes. When you wash them, you have to stay in your room till they dry. Imagine you had to leave your family, friend, and your country. How difficult would it be? Very little English, no one to talk with. Now, you have good luck if you are housed in Halifax and Calderdale. Although, on first sight, you would say it is only a small town with nothing to do. But after a while, you will find out 
how friendly and helpful people are in this town. For myself, it wasn't easy to manage this situation without the charity like St. Augustine Center. First, I started as a center member there. They helped me with registration with GP, dentist, and, and to study English. After that, I started working there as volunteer, such as translating and carpentry. Finally, after almost two years, I got leave to remain, and then I had to build my new life and could maybe move to other cities. But now I have many friends here and a town that I feel is my hometown. So because of this beautiful town and these amazing people, I decided to stay here and I have got a job. I work at St. Augustine Center as activity coordinator. I, have new I help new arrival to feel welcome uh, because I have experienced how it feels. I can give them hope of a better future. Now I'm happy here and say thank you to everyone who helped me during this process. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Arsalan. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to now invite Luke um, to come up and tell your story, please. Hi everybody, Hi, my name's Luke, um, I'm on a scheme called Shared Lives, I'm supported by Shared Lives, what entails is that, because I've not, I, I, I've been in care all my life and I've been out of care, so what it entails is I live with a carer, full time carer and a family, and um, as part of the family, she helps me to um, become like independent and develop my skills, sort of thing. Um, I have a good life. I'm part of the community, but I'm also like I go out into different places around the country and that. So yeah, that's good. Um, I'm good using buses and trains, which I'm independent with. Um, sorry. Now, COVID nineteen. It's had a major impact on us all. It has it's had a major impact on everybody. It definitely had a major impact on my mental health. But I did feel anxious. I felt anxious. Um, I also, sorry about this, guys. Um, my, my carer, she reassured me because we were all in the same boat at that time. It was an horrible time. It, it shouldn't have happened, but it's life. She encouraged and supported me to go out more which I do anyway, which is good. I feel more at ease now. I feel more at ease and I feel more com confident. I also felt part I also felt part of a family, which I do, yeah, she, my carer might not be my family, but she's sort of my family. And I am looking forward to college and all in September, meeting friends and also planning holiday. She also took time to talk to me. I felt at the time of COVID, I felt like I was in a prison, but I'm not now. My carer made me feel at ease and all. Um, I couldn't go out of college or anything. It did, but yeah, that that's and what else? What else? Oh, sorry, I couldn't sleep. I could, yeah, but no, I wasn't alone, and life's 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 much better now for for us all and for you. Yeah. So thank thank you for listening. Thank you. That's great, Luke. Thank you very much. And just like St. Augustine Centre, I, I've, I know Shared Lives and I know the programme uh, work very closely with Jane. And it, it's, a, it's a fantastic programme and it's something really, really valuable that we, we absolutely need to hang on to. Um, so thank you for that, Luke. Um, I'd like now to invite Kate um, to come up to the, uh, the microphone and just say a few words about your story. Kate. Hi, everybody. So, on the 23rd of February, 2020, my daughter gave birth to her first baby. And I was looking forward to being a hands-on, supportive grandma. But then just four weeks later, tears rolled down my face as I watched Boris Johnson on the news announcing a national lockdown. 
Because as a mother and a midwife, I knew instinctively how the pandemic was going to disrupt our lives. I was soon to be redeployed, as were many of my colleagues, not to COVID wards, but to support the reorganization of maternity services. Because antenatal care and the birth of a baby is not something that you can cancel or postpone to a later date. So our midwives and the whole team had to carry on, but we had to find ways to work differently. And looking back, I am incredibly proud of all my colleagues at Calderdale and Huddersfield NHS Trust because they've stepped up, they've worked harder, they've worked longer, and they continue to ensure that we provide care that is both safe and compassionate. Outside of work, I made it my purpose to find out everything I possibly could about COVID-19. I began watching webinars and podcasts run by doctors and academics across the world. To keep myself up to date with what was happening both locally and in other countries. I also trained as a COVID-19 vaccinator, building on my previous knowledge of the flu virus and vaccination of pregnant women, because vaccines save lives. And ultimately, vaccines have brought us to where we are today. And when I heard that some people were hesitant about having a COVID vaccine, I reached out and I used my expertise to offer a telephone advice service. It was simply called Call Kate. And over the next 12 months, I've been listening to the anxieties of pregnant women and couples who are planning a baby, answering their questions, helping them to make informed decisions about having a COVID vaccine. And now NHS services are getting back to a sort of new kind of normality. My beautiful granddaughter is a very happy and healthy two-year-old. It's very normal for her to meet others in outdoor spaces, such as Shibden Park. She's totally not faced to see people wearing face masks, and she's extremely competent at using FaceTime to chat to grandma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a journey, eh? What a journey, fantastic. Okay, so next I'd like to invite Roy uh, to come up to the microphone and just say a little bit about your story, Roy. I think I did that in the video. Oh, did you? Is there a video of Roy's? Have we got a video? No? Is there anything you'd like to, no. to kind of say about your story, Roy? Um... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can try. Good, great. <laughs> um, Hello. <laughs> Hello. I'm Roy's, Roy's friend <laughs> yes. and colleague. And um, Roy's got lived experience of learning disability, haven't you? So um, when lockdown happened, his support hours was cut from six hours to two hours. So Roy ended up um, having to learn to cook for himself, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, because he was eating lots of ready meals. What kind of things were you eating? Um, easy, easy food that, that, that you just put in the microwave. Yeah. So we were very concerned um, as Roy's friends that he wasn't eating like he, he should be doing to keep healthy. So. You part partnered up, didn't you, with um, a, an old yeah. friend from Lead the Way, and you did online cooking, didn't you? Yeah, so, and Karen did some, and then he did some. Yeah, so you sat on Zoom, and you learned how to cut all your vegetables, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you slow cook. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I used a slow cooker, and that kind of made us think, Oh, that's a good idea. So what did we do after, after um, 
We did a cooking project then, did yeah, we? Yeah, so we managed to get from some, uh, some funding to do a project what we call Cook Together, Share Together. And we've taken 48 people with learning disabilities through a cooking course. Um, they all got a slow cooker and um, a little mini chopper and they learned how to cook with a slow cooker because it's so easy to do cooking and batch cooking. Um, so what, what do you do? You cook, you cooked up, didn't you? Um, a batch and yeah. you put some in the freezer, didn't you? To... And that, now that, 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 what, that's what I do now is batch cooking. Yeah, yeah. And another thing that you did then, you, you thought, I really like cooking with people. So you and your friend, didn't you? You kind of joined yeah. up and did a Saturday cook-off, didn't you? So we watched yeah. on Zoom. You, you got Zoom, didn't you? They've even got Alexas that match now, don't you? And you can speak yeah. through your Alexas. It's brilliant. <laughs> um, and what you did was you did a Saturday cook-off, didn't you? I so, was able to show for people. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, you were responsible for most of the uh, people with learning disabilities in Calderdale for getting an Alexa. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you did, you did partner up with people to do the Zoom calls, but it also brought the idea for us to think, right, how can we take this further? And we also wanted to, to do it more, so because um, we did 24 people, we took through the course in Calderdale, but I could fill that again with the amount of people we took, took through. So, so you enjoyed yeah. it, didn't you? Yeah. So, he now sends me um, photographs of his uh, what, what he's cooked. I'm not joking. This man eats <laughs> so much. <laughs> he has a really big full plate, don't you, of um, all sorts of things that, you, that he's learned to cook himself. And it, it's really, really, really amazing how he's developed. And you love cooking now, don't you? Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's brilliant, Roy. Thanks very much for that. They're, they're superb life skills, aren't they? And I wish I wish I'd have taken a bit more notice during lockdown because the tendency is you just you, you do that, don't you? You just get a ready meal, put it in the microwave. It's nice and easy. But those those skills stay with you forever. So well done for that and all the the support that you've given to other people as well. Uh, and if we can get hold of your film that you did, we'll we'll see how we can we can in incorporate it in this presentation as well. So thank you, Roy, and thanks to Roy's friend as well. That's, that's absolutely superb. Um, okay, so um, next I'd like to invite uh, Khadija, um, who is going to just say a few words about her story. I come from mild summers and cold winters from West Yorkshire, Northern England, driving from sad and happy clouds, dancing all about. I come from four different trees, pink, green, orange, white, all alike. I am kind and polite, all right? I come from mosques and schools, all cool and full of jewels to use in life. I can say I can do anything in life because all I need is my brain and for me to give it pain. I come from a multicultural mix of sounds on the streets, engulfed with peace. I come from an ethnically diverse society, and me being Asian British. I have several tastes on my tongue. I come from humor, tradition, and good manners. Assalamu alaikum. I come from the crisp air coming in through open windows. I come from peace, a place where friendship is built every day. I come from the homemade side of roti salam, biryani shani, etc. The oiliness of takeouts, samosa, shose, roll, shol, salal, shad, indulgent desserts, iced coffee, which all revert to loyal takeouts at birthdays. I come from hybrid cars and rickshaws. I come from a kind, loving, traditional family with praising and amazing parents, two talented and gallant sisters, three intelligent, successful shields, inventive, curious, and furious brothers. I come from the incredible inspiration of my family circle and my choice to use my voice like Marcus Rashford, Malala Yousafzai, Greta Thunberg, but this all puts in work and then a smirk. I am confident, not shy. I am kind and polite, all right? I am from the vision of statues attached to the ground with directed poses to be remembered, not forgotten. I am from many industries which are 
thinked and linked back to and reflected on. I am who I am. I come from shopping and enjoyment places at the Peace Hall, which is very tall, Shivden Park, full of sparks, Greenhouse Tower, superpower, Dean Clough Mills, chilled and skilled, and the Shea, making way. All totally exquisite. I come from a delicate, pretty, comfortable, not insufferable room, full of dreams, desires, passions, and prayers, with a fragrant, pungent perfume that never vanishes its scent. I come from delightful donuts, cake, cookie dough, milkshakes, candy floss, and lots of other desserts arriving and still waiting for me at Dessert Island. I come from British movies and Asian dramas, 6 p.m. till 11 p.m., sometimes till 1 a.m., both Pakistani and English styles with smiles of contrast. I come from the hatred of all types of maths, just like sats. I come from black and white uniforms, teachers and friends, place to be, reflection time, commander's house for illness, mask from student window, because of this pivoting pandemic, not leaving us to one side, just used to I'm just used to it, just normal, not abnormal or informal. I worry about why not bright someone else's day with lights, might, and excitement. I come from silence and patience. I dream for a day fulfilling my wishes and me with succession. I feel an angel's wings shadowing my good times with a lot of different lines and signs. I come from Fenton Road, crammed with bricks, squealing, grinding, and growling. But Enough of the rooms, because when night comes and sounds fade and sees slowly and slowly. I hope it happens every day, where even going on the streets, there'll be peace and no police. I am kind and polite, all right? I am from hope. I am from a historic and stunning town. I am who I am because of everyone. I come from the Halifax Academy. I come from the homes of the hearts, minds, and connects. I am Khadija Noor. I come from Halifax. Thank you. You need to publish that, Khadija, you really do. That was wonderful, superb. What can you say? Um, all I can say is I'm going to hand over to Mungo Shepherd to tell you a little bit about his story. And he has promised that he's not going to do his customary 35 minutes. <laughs> Mungo, over to you. Thank you. I've been on a few stages. I'm not sure I've ever heard a speech as good as that. That was incredible. Thank you. So I'm the head teacher at Askreen Community Primary School in Mixenden. Very proud every day, really proud today to have a couple of ex-students who spoke brilliantly about climate change. You were an absolute credit to us, thank you. Uh, but as people will know, we've had a very difficult year up at Ash Green. On the night of the 1st of February 2022, uh, we had a terrible fire at one of the sites of our school. Uh, and the horror of what we lost, a whole block destroyed, four classrooms, storerooms, resource cupboards, ICT storage, all the children's work, the teachers' cupboards and the rest of the building that remains standing, smoke and water damaged, the grounds covered in rubble. And despite an incredible effort by the firefighters who saved a big part of the school, we lost a lot too. But that night, as soon as it happened, the immediate response from the local authority was amazing. The leader of the council, you've heard this morning, Tim, was there within minutes. The MP, Holly Lynch, who you all know is incredible, was on the phone as I stood on the road watching it burn. But there were people coming out of the houses, coming from all over to hug us, to wish as well. And the night after, and the day after that, schools, businesses were in constant touch. When I got home that night on the Wednesday, I had 148 unread uh, emails in my inbox. Most were offers of support or just kind wishes. And every day I was saying to Michael just then, as we had a toilet break, every day felt like a week in that initial period. We are having to get as many children back to school as quickly as possible. Look to find solutions to reallocate space, reorder all the resources. 1,000 invoices had to be reordered. Pick the children and the families and the staff up from the floor where they've been dumped metaphorically. 
And we're also helping the police and firefighter colleagues with their investigations and inquiries. At the same time, trying to oversee a demolition programme and immediately find as much space as we lost and more. And I cried a few tears and I slept very little hours, then I got COVID. But what carried me through to help carry the school and the community through was the incredible support from near, far and wide, including a lot of people in this room. Immediate offers of support came in and were coordinated by key staff at school. You know, pocket money from children, uh, dress down days at school, museums and play gyms offering free visits, a car wash led by the fire crew who saved our school, supported by staff, families and supporters, again including Holly, washing cars for us. The church who opened its doors every single day, Dean Clough offering space for the children to come together. Businesses, community foundations coordinating large scale fundraising, concerts at social clubs, fundraising night, race nights, sponsored swims, donations of resources, the list is endless endless and it's still carrying on now, nearly four months later. And over the next few weeks, things were moving at 100 miles per hour. The building that was left needed new flooring, new ceilings, rewiring, plumbing. We achieved all of that in three weeks. And whilst the children were given hand-delivered packs of learning and food for the 12 days of learning that they lost, that was it. Again, supported by community volunteers and secondary school students. The most vulnerable children from the upper site attended at the lower site. The others were offered activities over at the church, Dean Clough, Eureka. And after only 12 school days, as I said, since fire ripped through the school, we squeezed all the upper site children back into every nook and cranny, setting up classes and resources in the hall, the dining hall, the library, the corridors. And three weeks after that, the delivery of the modular classroom were complete. They were coming into land as the kids were walking back on the first day. And they were furnished and they were powered. We had deliveries of toilet blocks, creation of new car parking facilities from scratch, again helped by everybody pulling together for our school. Children and staff made huge moves, literally from an old lost building to areas of school with any space at all, to now brand new, albeit temporary facilities. And at every step of the way, the support that we were receiving from the community of Calderdale was humbling and it was also essential. There were volunteers helping to literally move mountains, organisations across the borough stepping in to offer counselling support, alternative activities to the children who could not cope. I knew I just needed to pick up a phone, send an email and anyone in this council and anybody further uh, would help. And still we were kept going by the love and support of the people around us. Messages flooding in, kindness everywhere we looked. T Mash Green, hashtag T Mash Green, was trending on Twitter. And through some dark days, we saw that that team was much bigger than just mixing them. And now to finish, we're at another crossroads. We're stable, we're happy. The 120 children who lost their classrooms and their learning facilities are being taught in smart modular classrooms. They're making light of the 100 meter outdoor trips every day to the playground, the hall, the dining hall. As I said to Becky, as a Calderdale Active School Trailblazer, we're actually embracing that. We've got kids skipping and lunging and jumping through the rain down to assembly. Links have been made that we'll never lose with schools like Ibrey and William Henry Smith to build lasting support for some of our most vulnerable children. And finally, the next couple of months are going to see some big decisions made. I've got great support from the council, working with Julie Jenkins, working with Tim and his uh, colleagues in the cabinet, as we look together uh, on a blueprint for the rebuild of our upper site to build back better and stronger for this incredible community of Mixenden, which reached out to us and deserve everybody's support. What is certain is that wherever we end up will have been carried there by a wave of support and affection from the people of this great borough. So thank you, Calderdale. Thank you. And I think we've got to add our thanks to you personally, Mungo, for being that catalyst, that energizer in a lot of this support. So it's, it's great to have you on board and, and thank you for that. Um, last but certainly not least uh, in this section, I have pleasure in welcoming to the microphone, Dr. Lisa Pickles, who has just a few words to say about her story. Lisa. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, this is great. I can actually see people. I'm usually going, welcome to my kitchen and gazing at a screen. So, fab to see everyone here. Um, just to introduce myself, I've been a GP in Calderdale for more than 30 years. And 
became clinical lead for the Calderdale vaccination program in December 2020. I was about to semi-retire, actually. <laughs> Um, and I actually left the clinical lead program in January 2022, so I'm now back to part-time general practice, not quite retired yet. So enough about me, here's my story. It's December 2020. We'd had months of stressful change to our GP services with frightened patients and staff. Yet COVID rates were still high in Calderdale and we'd been in some form of lockdown locally for much longer than a lot of the UK. Elderly and vulnerable patients were isolated and falling ill both physically and mentally. But the vaccine had arrived. So GPs grouped in primary care networks and the clinical commissioning group joined forces to start protecting Calderdale residents as soon as we could, giving vaccines prior to Christmas that year, which was ahead of much of the UK. Vaccination started with our most aged patients who braved ice and snow with their sticks, zimmers and wheelchairs. Most hadn't been out at all for a year or so during the pandemic, but everyone gratefully attended their appointments. And we kept them safe with masks, gel, distancing and fresh air, working with our windows wide open in sub-zero temperatures. Car park attendants, ushers, clinical and admin teams wore Christmas hats thermal clothing and smiles, stopping for the occasional gulp of tea whilst happily working flat out. It felt good to be able to do something positive at last. And our teams have included and been supported by council staff, volunteers, retired doctors, nurses, the charity sector, COVID champions and public health, as well as staff in schools, including Trinity Sixth Form. I think that was my stethoscope, actually, that was on one of those shadow films earlier on. Uh, but staff in mosques, St. Augustine's, and the Peace Hall, to name but a few. And also remembering the circus clinic, dodging all the wasps near the candy floss stall vaccinating a tightrope walker and dealing with the national media, which was scary to say the least. And at the Acapulco of mixing the vaccines on the bar and enjoying lively background music. Wherever needed, we can take a team. On reflection, the vaccine program has really brought us together to work as a place, i.e. Calderdale, with the one shared goal and no barriers to working together. I've been staggered by everyone's enthusiasm and cheer. We must ensure our joint working continues. It feels like collectively we can breathe again but the virus is still around and we need to keep our immunity to covid as high as we can vaccinations will continue and it remains important to get your vaccine the virus seems to be on the back foot let's keep it there so JCVI are planning an autumn vaccine campaign. Potentially boosters will be offered to the elderly, vulnerable and frontline health and social care workers as we head into another winter. The work goes on. And finally, a shout out for our primary care teams who have given at least 60% of Calderdale vaccines whilst continuing their usual work and treating COVID related illness. NHS England operating guidance has slowed us down. Though now we're allowed to relax those measures, we're short staffed and demand is high. So spare a thought for our teams who remain dedicated, but exhausted. So 
thanks so much, everybody, for listening. Fantastic. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you also to all our contributors for this session. Uh, it's been really heartwarming to hear your stories, and thank you for giving up your time to join us today and share your experiences. So a big hand for our, our contributors. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. So our next panel is um, the Coming Together to Support Each Other panel. And I'm going to be joined on stage by Samina Arshad, who is a community link worker who came to Calderdale from Pakistan and overcame several barriers to become an integral part of the community. Uh, Samina now helps others to overcome similar barriers and live fulfilling lives. So welcome, Samina. Thank you. I'm also joined by Katie Clark, who supported um, disabled people to have a voice in Calderdale's regeneration plans, believing our voices are stronger together and that we can influence change by working in co-production with agendas driven by those with lived experiences. Welcome, Katie. I'm also joined by Kia Hamilton Adams, who is a project manager at Calderdale's mental health charity, Healthy Minds, which changes life by empowering people to cope with life's challenges. Uh, Kia has also recently managed a successful trailblazing mental health and wellbeing project, Calderdale Cares for Us. So welcome. <laughs> I'd also like to welcome Julie Trudgill, who is a shared lives carer who offers a home and support to a person with a learning disability who lives with her as part of the family. Um, this person-centered service gives individuals a chance to experience life with a family. So welcome to you, Julie. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, I welcome on stage Jeff Turner, who is co-founder of Verdigree, whose approach is for people to find their voice and express themselves in diverse environments to tackle issues using creative arts as a catalyst for engagement and change. So welcome to you, Jeff. Thank you. I think these are working. Yes, they are. Fantastic. So we've... I'll give you that first, Jeff, if that's okay. As before, we do have some questions from the audience, um, which were sent, uh, our virtual audience, which, is, which was sent in ahead of today. Um, I'd like, first of all, Jeff, if I can ask you um, the first question, which is how do the creative arts, hang on a minute, I'll just get my pad ready, right. Jeff, how do how can the creative arts support intergenerational working and our aim to be an age-friendly borough? I had a different question. Did you? <laughs> yes. How's that one for you? Do you want a different question? You can question? do that one if you want. Yeah, go on, Jeff. Okay. Let's so, play it. Let's, uh, yeah, let's go with that one. Somebody behind me when I was sitting uh, earlier, their, their phone went off and it, um, and it was a happy birthday, I think, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, and it reminds me that uh, this coming Saturday will be my 21st birthday <laughs> of, of living in Calderdale. <laughs> so, and in those 21 years, I've, I've probably worked with like 75% of the organizations in this room, uh, Lead the Way, the Women's Center. The very first project we ever delivered in Calderdale was with the Women's Center. Uh, and what we did when we came to uh, Calderdale was to explore ways in which the creative arts could impact on social change, really. There have been some remarkable films shown today about the high profile impact that the creative arts can have uh, around, certainly around economic regeneration and a national, drawing a national attention to the borough, to places like Halifax, which when I came here 21 years ago, 
if you told me what it was going to be like in 21 years time, I don't think I would ever have believed you. I didn't, I'd never been to Halifax before, uh, before we came to live here. I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about its history really. And it's been a, a revelation in those uh, 21 years. Um, but, but as an organization, what we, what we wanted to do most of all was to, to listen to local people to listen to some of the issues that they were dealing with. We were, we were dealing with intergenerational drift. We were dealing with communities that lived apart, that didn't uh, know very much about each other. We, we, we met schools where children really didn't know that much about uh, children from different ethnic backgrounds, about their cultures, about their heritage. So over 21 years, we've set out to um, develop work that's rooted in community, that's about listening to people, that's about working with local organizations. We should be very proud in Calderdale that we have such remarkable um, community involvement and the stake from the voluntary sector. It's really quite remarkable. Um, Fantastic. Thanks very much, Jeff. No, superb. Thank you. Um, okay, next question. I'm going to ask Julie if you'd like to uh, take the, the microphone. And a question for you. How important is person-centred care to support, to support those in need? Well, I'm going to read this. That might sound a bit wooden. But um, person-centred care is so important when supporting people with social or health needs, ensuring they're empowered and continue to, to be in control of their own lives. Person-centred care considers a person's needs, wishes, desires. It supports people to learn, develop new skills, build on existing skills and to increase in confidence. It enables people requiring support to achieve the positive outcomes which are important to them in their life. It equips them to make informed choices and decisions about their own life and health. Carers and professionals supporting people in this way will always work collaboratively to achieve the outcomes desired by the person supported. Just as an add-on, Luke lived with me for three years and we had a wonderful time together and some ups and downs and uh, he's not here at the moment. <laughs> Head on to that, so. Fantastic. No, thanks for that, Julie. That's that's great. And I, I do think that the, the work that you're doing is 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 really valuable and the, the results are, are astonishing. So thank you for that. Okay, so moving on to Kia, can I ask you um, the question uh, that we've we've um, been provided with is the impact on the pandemic has been particularly hard on frontline workers. So the question is, how has Calderdale Cares for Us supported frontline workers to cope with these relentless pressures? So Calderdale Cares for Us is a project that um, set out to support the public and voluntary sector of Calderdale. So basically all frontline workers could access the support that we were offering. Uh, we set out because the funding came from Public Health Calderdale with the only stipulation was to improve the mental health and well-being of Collardale's public sector. So with very few stipulations, we set out and created a project which was flexible. Uh, it listened to the needs of uh, the public sector um, and they fed back to us continually throughout the project and we changed and added services as we got feedback from them for what they wanted. So it was a project completely for them, fueled by their needs, by their wants. Um, and it's actually been amazing to sort of watch and to hear some of the stories from people about how it's helped them, how it's helped them help Calderdale. Um, you know, we haven't just offered mental health support in what I like to call the mental health bread and butter, so your counselling, your therapies. We've also offered stone carving, wild foraging, art workshops, um, singing, you know, we've shown Calderdale that you can care for your mental health in many, many ways. All of this has been free to the public sector, so to those frontline workers, and they've been able to access it when they want um, throughout the past year. Um, we've had no sort of limits on it. It's been anyone who's worked for the NHS, anyone who works for the fire, anyone who works for the police, 
um, anyone who works at the council, um, that includes people who work in our voluntary sector because we see that as a necessary resource as well, especially coming from somebody who works in a voluntary sector organisation. Um, and, you know, it's been amazing. We've had from our feedback, we've seen 98% of people have said that it's improved their emotional well-being. And it's really good to see that we've been able to support um, the Calderdale's frontline in this way and just thank them for all the work that they've done for us. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That's that's really nice to hear. Thank you, Kia. OK, so Katie, can I ask um, you a question? And could you tell us a little bit about how Accessible Calderdale has provided a voice um, to disabled people in the community? Yeah, thank you. And I'd just like to say Calderdale does care. I took advantage of being a parent carer and having some of the services that you offered free and Olwyn's here today and I was able to get some support around my own back um, and posture. So that's been great. And what a caring place Calderdale is. We moved here 25 years ago because it was one of two local authorities that had signed an agreement to inclusive education together with Newham down in London. So ever since then, we felt part of a community. However, I do really understand the barriers that disabled people face daily, the challenges around the systems, around the support services, the physical barriers, the lack of information in accessible format. I also really truly understand the attitudinal barriers people's attitudes where they look at the disability, not the person. So for many years, I've been fortunate enough to listen to the voices of disabled people who are so often forgotten, invisible, and not heard. And having a daughter who doesn't have a voice, she uses an electronic communication aid instead, she has a strong voice, and she's been able to go down to the Houses of Parliament and express herself and challenge and be brave. And that's what we want in Calderdale. So the Accessible Calderdale project brings together disabled people and their family members to have a voice. And we often hear about co-production, but what does that really, really mean? It means, and Tim mentioned it in his speech, it means trust, it means relationships. It's about building connections it's about being human, and it's about listening to the voices of people. But in doing so, we need to bring disabled people, people with lived experience together in a safe, a brave place so they can express themselves. They can share their deep insight into the many, many issues that they face daily. And we've done that through, in 2016, we brought together disabled people in Hebden Bridge and we did, thanks to the Community Foundation, over 45 access audits on some small premises, some larger places like the Trades Club, the Town Hall, the Birchcliff Centre, Squeeze Cafe, places that really embraced diversity and accessibility. The Hebden Bridge Disability Access Forum continues and is supported by the Parish Council. They're fundamental to new buildings, new plans, the railway station. They've produced a, a fantastic map that's a step-free map that disabled people who come to the area, visitors, tourists, can pick up at the town hall. Since then, we built on that project and we now run the Accessible Calderdale project with disabled people at the heart of co-production. We listen to their daily challenges. We've got a transport group, because if you can't get anywhere, if you can't even leave the front door because the pavement's not wide enough and there's a car parked, what do you do? If you can't get on a bus to go to Cromwell Bottom, what can you do? So transport is key. Accessible taxis are key. We need to be, get more and more involved in transport issues. And luckily we have, we've been part of the new planning, the A629 corridor. We've been part of having disabled people's voices, the new bus stops around town. We've got disabled people involved in the leisure center, just the, the train station, the bus station, and in countryside. And a big thanks to all those who've received my emails 
Many of you here have had my emails reminding you, prompting you, do not forget disability. Great. Thanks, Katie. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. So, Samina, on to you. Um, from your experience, what practical things can we do to bring people together and break down barriers? Thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, I came from Pakistan 32 years ago when I was 17 years old. Uh, I left my school. It was very hard coming to new countries after traveling 20 hours. When I get here, it, when I open my eyes, it, it was December, dark black walls. And I was like feeling very lonely where I am. The cultures were, was different, couldn't speak a word. Uh, the food was different. I didn't have any of my friends and family here. A few years I was at home, very depressed. But one thing made me believe on myself that I need to learn the language if I want to live in this country. I've started to learn English from very basic uh, because then I communicate to the people where I'm going to live. It was not easy because when you can't speak English, you don't know the culture, when you are finding it very hard. But luckily, I have a very good husband who's been very supportive to me. I've done 15 years work in our community, helping our, especially BME women, helping them to tackle with isolation, loneliness, depression, and helping them to find the jobs, voluntary and paid. Thank you very much working for the Cordadale and especially for the neighborhood team. And I have lovely people who help me, who I am, because it's not easy when you don't know the language, you don't know where to go. But when, I, when I've got this job, I've helped so many people, like tackling, empowering them to work, and think about themselves, taking them to hospital, talking about the mental health issue, talking about the vaccines, like setting up different groups. But one thing I really would like to say, thank you very much what I am, because Curdedale and neighborhood team, they gave me opportunity to work because otherwise I was the only housewife, but I work part-time. I really enjoy my job every day when I leave home. I leave home very positive because I'm empowering women, whoever come to me. I always tell them, think positive and positive things will happen to you. And every day I support women like in different aspect of life. And I really, really enjoy living in Curdedale because we've got beautiful scenery. I do lots of uh, cooking session in different groups. And one thing I would like to say, the cooking and the food bring community together. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I would like to say thank you very much to invite me over here. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Well done, Samina. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, that's great. And I, I would just like to say thank you to you all for participating in this panel. It's been really useful and interesting to hear your, your thoughts and the wonderful work that your organizations are doing. So please give a, a big round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was quite heartwarming and emotional, don't you think? And next up, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Robin Tudnam, Chief Executive of Calderdale Council and Accountable Officer for NHS to the stage. It's quite a moment, isn't it, as we come together at this point because it was one of the very last things, and some of you were here two years ago before those lockdowns that totally transformed our lives. And one of the things that struck me listening this morning is that there are some new challenges ahead, um, but we shouldn't just move on and forget the impact that COVID has had and will continue to have, sadly, for some individuals for some time, but certainly for us in neighborhoods and places. So. I really think it's a brilliant testimony to the work that our amazing team have done to enable unheard voices to be heard, 
And those of you who have been around a while know that the Vision 2024, which we're now four years into, half of which has been the pandemic, um, talked about hearing heard and unheard voices. So it's really wonderful that that's what we're hearing. And then I kind of bring things to a close towards the end of the morning. I'm going to go through some images uh, and I'm going to talk about the theme of today and the privilege of being in the joint role that I've been in now since 2020 for the local authority in the NHS and some of the things about what that means. But actually, I can pick out a few bits and, and jump a few bits because some of you have already spoken brilliantly about the way we are together and the way we work as one in Calderdale. I won't replicate the excellent input from Lisa uh, around the vaccine rollout, but in terms of things we shouldn't forget, the moment of crisis and the moment of impetus that we came together to deliver the vaccine at that kind of crazy, ridiculous time scale. And just Lisa, um, one thing that Lisa wouldn't say, because she's too modest to, but Lisa was very much not only the convener, but at the heart of delivering personally vaccines to some of our housebound communities in some very remote locations at some um, untimely times in the year, I know, um, in those kind of um, hills and the hilltop villages at a really difficult time. And primary care has had a hard time, you know, we know that. It's been a really tough time. Sadly, I, um, I, I kind of am reading too many personal experiences and talking to those in primary care who wonder whether they can continue in primary care. And certainly in aspects of the media, it seems that unbelievable. I think 10 years ago, we probably couldn't have thought that GPs would be the kind of focus of a uh, cough and a bit of a kicking in, in, in some, of the, some of the mainstream media. And it has been a tough time. But actually, the way that we did that through primary care, working with our brilliant public health team under Debs' leadership, working with our CCG team, with Neil Smirthwhite as our SRO, was amazing. We shouldn't forget that. But also the legacy of participation of the 140 community champions that have been created Voices within community. I'll work with our faith community, so it wasn't just a one-off thing. It's going to be a long-term legacy. And we are in recovery whilst knowing that we're still living with the impacts. And um, it's going to be a long old haul, I think, and with some challenges ahead. And um, I was in a... I, I'm not having to do the next slide, please, to someone, thankfully. And I, I know people often say, next slide, please, as Chris Whitty would say. Um, but one of the things I will say about Chris Whitty is that I was recently in a Faculty of Public Health meeting where he was talking mainly to directors of public health and academics in public health, and it was great to be in there. And one of the things that really struck with me, what he said was, it's been the hardest two years of our lives. Unfortunately, the next two years are probably going to be harder. And... He didn't quite use his words, but I interpreted that as the new pandemic of inequalities that we will be dealing with as public health professionals is a greatest even challenge than what we've been through. So I know that it's often things that we must, sometimes might get accused of saying we come on and say great news and we have great news stories. I think some great news stories in this, but there's some tough times ahead and it would be wrong for me to, to avoid and deny that fact. But we are a place, if any place can come through this, that is talented and enterprising. Two of our key words, and you've heard that from our young people, our brilliant young people, our brilliant partners today. And we are a place who has made education the core to who we are and Mungo's story of recovering from crisis and the way community came together. And the story of this building, because some of you have been around long enough to know that there was, and sorry if anyone's here from the campaign, but certain campaign to not bulldoze our library which was the former building, which is now the Trinity Academy, which is now an offset outstanding place for young people at A-level stage to get the best possible education amongst now a, a, a thriving and powerful sector. But actually that's been the missing bit for us, that our mainstream education up to 16 has been really strong. Our progress scores are often showing in the top two or three in the north not always able to lead that into work opportunities at 16 plus. So that's really important. And that's a reality for lots of young people that do want to come into a town centre college. And it's been lovely to see young people in town centre as we recover. And then some more challenges ahead, but some opportunities. And I know Katie's talking about how we all work to consult. And 
Maybe it may be we, we can get it right for everyone, but actually a major investment in our town in leisure, but also part of the biggest ever capital program we've had. You've seen the bus station that's in Halifax. You've seen the rail station that will come. You'll see the flood infrastructure works in our valleys. I'll work across Calderdale, a small team working relentlessly to deliver these programs to make Calderdale a better place. Going into one of, and this is actually one of the opportunities, and of course we welcome investment. We welcome this money coming in from government. The new version of the money following Brexit for the Shared Prosperity Fund, which there's been an opportunity to talk to colleagues about today. And it's going to be impossible, I'll say this now, to meet everyone's expectations. There isn't enough money, there's too many things we want to do, and we will need to think about really thinking about those things I've said about inequalities and deprivation, and really those that need that support the most. But also in the context that we're the only local authority to ha in the country to have strong towns and Brickhouse and Tobedon, 36 million pounds, future high streets, Elland and Halifax Town Centre, and a future high street in Sorby Bridge. We're the only place to have all three of those investments with town boards to realise that potential. So we do need to think, how does this fund meet those areas that maybe hasn't got those opportunities? I'm not going to go through these stats. I'll, I'll leave you a slide. And I'll say with some of these stats, there's some good stories in here, but actually there's some stories where we haven't, haven't actually improved, where we've flatlined or in some cases worsened. Uh, we will be providing you with a data pack around all our performance. So in one document, you can see how we've done. We've still got some great stuff around business sustainability and education, but actually it's been a tough time. And in all that time, I don't need to say how kindness and resilience has shown through in Calderdale in everything it does. But I will just say a little bit about the Ukraine response. I know Sarah, Sarah was here from St. Augustine's earlier, but I will just before I say that, say that this is part of a response to migration and refugees and asylum seekers as a valley of sanctuary, where actually most of the people fleeing don't get talked about, don't often get heard. The experience of someone seeking asylum here have very little money to live on, often living in really poor conditions, often uncertain for many months, often in hotels, coming from Afghanistan, coming from Africa, coming from Southeast Asia, from all over the world. They're the stories that you don't often hear about. But alongside that, the work that St. Augustine's and brilliant teams do to deal with those issues has been an incredible response. Literally driving lorries from Calderdale to Ukraine and to the surrounding areas to support those families. Welcoming people, and I know there's been some challenges in the bureaucracy of this, but we, you know, we are working to get that right and working with government to get that right, to welcome people through the community scheme to host families in, from Ukraine, a devastating war that is not looking like it's going to end anytime soon. And also not forgetting some of those core resilience threats. And it was a bit later and a bit more expensive than we hoped, of course. But at last, we saw that moment where Mythe and Royd had those properties protected at, at the launch late last year. And one thing that we don't talk about when we talk about flooding is always the mental health impact of the near misses. So we went into the pandemic, you may remember, weeks after Storm Kira, with around a third of the properties flooded in that winter in England were in the Calder Valley and that devastating event. But what we don't talk about always is the 16 times the sirens went off in 2020 in the pandemic. Now, none of those led to a flood event, but imagine the impact of that happening in the pandemic in lockdown. But also imagine it happening again in the future. We do believe through this winter that that, that that scheme has protected properties. We've got more to come with Brighouse and Hebden Bridge, but we will know we can't stop the work on that. And then our fundamental principle and, and our overarching principle of Calderdale Cares and our brand. As we move to, as many of you know, the new health and care arrangements of the West Yorkshire Partnership from the 1st of July, my role becomes place lead designate for health and care. The CCG doesn't exist from the 30th of June. But for us, us, it's a steady state of many of the same, most of the same colleagues, the work needs to be done, but with providers, with commissioners coming together 
to do what we need to do. And as Kenneth mentioned earlier, around a health and well-being strategy around our life course. So starting well, developing well, living well, aging well, living well at all of your life journey. And that's what we've done. And building on that principle that we've always had on, on the vision. If there's one thing you say about the vision, we want people to live a larger life, a life that was bigger than maybe they thought or others thought was possible. Because for God's sake, the last two years, we've been living smaller lives and we need to begin that larger life again. And again, as colleagues have mentioned, I won't say more really about the age-friendly borough, but it's really important as a statement of our intent in terms of re respecting aging, aging well, aging being a strength and asset in asset-based communities and places, but also respecting active Calderdale. And um, it's actually Debs' predecessor who said to me, if exercise was a drug, they'd ban it. Yeah? The power of exercise, the power of movement, and the difference. And if some of you like to run, you might cycle, you might go long distances. Um, I quite like to run. Um, the power from nothing to 15 minutes, the power of nothing to 30 minutes is so much bigger than whether you're active and you do a bit more being active. But just those times we are seeing now in our surgeries, in our voluntary sector organisations, the impact of the pandemic. And we need to think about being active, being well, because of the long-term conditions that people will experience through not being active. I mean, it's some brilliant work with our communities through Richard and the team, and do find out more if you don't know about it. And there's just some stats there to show some of the ways we've been kind and resilient. But also, it's been a pandemic, but it hasn't stopped us being distinctive. And this one, probably way beyond anything that we imagined back in 2018. We didn't know, and you may recall, we, um, the last things we did was we gave Sally Wainwright freedom of the borough at the town hall, and then Sally gave the keynote speech two years ago. And then we knew the story of Gentleman Jack would come to the world, and now the world is coming to us. With 500 women from the US coming over just last month when they had to delay because of the pandemic, the last part of this series um, on, I think, Sunday night of Gentleman Jack and the impact of people feeling validated. And when I wrote a, a, a message to staff about that, and some, a couple of colleagues did write to me saying that the, the voice it gave, the sense of Calderdale embracing this and the opportunities to tell a story. And we want to tell um, and listen to the story even more because of the sense of the story it gives to women, but men, to all people to feel they can be who they want to be, they can be their authentic selves regardless of their sexuality. But also the incredible story that increasingly I'm saying, uppermost of all, Anne Lister was a writer. She was a landowner, she was quite a feisty character. She was a traveler, she was a mountaineer. Um, but most of all, she was a writer. The fact she wrote this down and that we've now crowdsourced the rest of her story through people and fans, it's incredible. And we're a hotspot for filming. We're a hotspot for activity everywhere. It's absolutely amazing. Marvel, from Marvel at the Peace Hall to Gallows Pole, the story of the coiners. I mean, what a Coldwell story of this gang who basically created their own currency. And then the king having to send his top man to break this gang. And it's literally, it's a Coldwell story. Yeah. First of all, Calder Valley, no one will find us. Secondly, we ain't going to do what the king tells us. We're going to do what we think is right for Calderdale, even if we're actually creating counterfeit currency. So, but what a story. And if you've read the Gallows Poll in the dialect, it's amazing. But I can't wait to see what will be a chaotic, brilliant story unfold. Amongst other things, Last Tango and Happy Valley coming with us very soon. And then the Peace Hall effect. What a tough time it's been for all our destinations. The kind of places Katie talked about that we're working with to make them accessible. But actually, what a recovery. Sophia Riders, her hairs have just gone as we prepare for the markets and the gigs all the way through the summer. Amazing. Some more tickets released tomorrow for some of the ones that are sold out, so be there. But also, what a community asset it's become. Whether it's the recent Eid party, it's the Jubilee events next week, um, the Emergency Services Day on Friday, if you've got any children that want to have get into a fire engine or 
talk to the police or, or, or ambulance um, be there, but what a sense of ownership because when I came to Peace Hall um, the first time and I talked to people and they said, we talked to young people, they said, it's, our, it's, it's meet you at the Peace Hall. It's my Peace Hall. It's not a place people just come to visit and tick it off. It's a place to visit again and again. And testimony to the trust and everyone that's made that happen. St. Augustine's and the Pell and Scout group, the brilliant thing that they did recently. It's been amazing. And then the, her the, the landscape, the beautiful landscape that we've kind of kept a little bit quiet because actually I know talking to some um, members of cabinet and colleagues recently, we are starting to see some of the impact of the tourism being almost a challenge as well as an opportunity with its Airbnb, with its traffic, with its the impact on the resident neighbourhood in parts of the Upper Valley. And we know that that is a challenge. It's the first time we really had that challenge, but actually we need to bring people out, not just from the towns, into the place, working with Pennine Prospects in the new model of the landscape park. We will do that, and it was launched last year. And that was one of our vision aspirations. And we've still got some work to do here around the stats and the journeys that we make. And then with two years until Vision 2024, how we tell the story of the future of the borough between now and then, consult people, but also begin to think about what next. And we will be doing reset, relaunch, working with Debs and her team over the next few months to rebuild, reboot this, because we need to make sure that in 2024, we make the most of this story and we really do tell the story of Calderdale and more to come on that. So I'll finish with some news. Three things to say, to announce that are really exciting. And as always, only part of all of the things we'll be doing um, in some cases. And one of the challenging things we'll be dealing with in one case. So really exciting that um, John Rees, who I think is still with us from the college, has been an absolute hero for seven years as such a can-do partner uh, with a great team here at the college. There's nothing that he ever says, no, we can't do it to. We'll always find a solution. But always the college sees itself as part of the system and the place. And huge thanks to John for not when he got his new opportunity, his new job, not just saying, right, I'll, I'll, I'll do my months and then I'll go off and do my new role, but really throwing himself into the work around rebuilding the Health and Care Academy model for health and care workforce that you desperately need in Calderdale. So a huge thanks to John and my huge personal thanks to John for being such a great partner. We will take that forward with a legacy that you've created for us. Thank you. And then one of the challenges, which is that the mental health impacts of the pandemic has been significant, as you all know. And we are a place that is an outlier in terms of rates of suicide and particularly in one location in Calderdale. And there's some really important work that we've commissioned some people to do, talking to communities about how we rethink that location, how we think about a place that is signifying all the things we don't want Calderdale to be and make something more positive. And watch this space for more news about that work and all of the brilliant contributions that people have made at how we rethink and imagine the challenges for our place because it's a really tough challenge and it has a personal resonance for people and we want to shift that into a positive way. And then finally, I'm just going to announce and excitedly say that today is a day we formally launch Culture Dale, which will be, and there's badges and there's um, some brilliant people led by Bobsey and her team in the arts and culture team, working with Diana in Visitor economy who will be launching this and consulting on people which will be our early our year of culture in 2024 supported by some funding from the west yorkshire combined authority leading up to the moment of the first of april when we are 50 years old as a local authority but also this is about place this isn't just about the council it's about place how we celebrate and there's a big announcement tomorrow about the city of culture of course you'll know where i where i hope the announcement is going to be. Let's hope it is. Um, whatever happens, there'll be something big, I think, in Bradford in 2025. 
there'll be a big year in Leeds in 2023, and also the Kirk Lees Year of Music next year. So this is our moment, and the Mayor of West Yorkshire is already talking about this as such a powerful moment in our, in our own right, but as a moment into the city of culture, which we hope desperately was is Bradford. So I'm going to leave it there with a, um, I think, a short film. I'll come back at the end very briefly to say some thank yous, but thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was Robin Tudnam, our Chief Executive. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> so, we've just got a couple of minutes before our final performance. So, I'd like you to reach for your phones again, if you can, and uh, go through those instructions as you did so wonderfully at the start of this event. And just in one word, Tell us, what sort of place do you want Calderdale to be in the future? And this is thinking of 2024 and beyond. So just one word, if you won't mind. You did this so wonderfully earlier on. I have no doubt that you will be able to do this just as wonderfully again. And for everybody watching at home, maybe you can participate too. Just one word. How do we see Calderdale? What sort of place do you want it to be in the future? Inclusive and vibrant are winning this time. I have to start, stop making it sound like a horse race. Sustainable, inclusive, vibrant, thriving, exciting, kind. Has somebody put connected? No. That's brilliant. Inclusive and sustainable. That's great. Right, okay, so thank you for doing that. This will obviously help us uh, in, in kind of framing, um, uh, along with all the work that Robin mentioned about the consultations that are going to, uh, that are going to be ongoing in the borough. So I have um, pleasure now in handing back to Natalie, who is going to uh, announce our final performance, Natalie. It's our last performance for today, set to the song Imagine, song recorded by students in Calderdale College. This is a thought-provoking and emotional performance.
Casadale College students. Once again, I would like to invite Robin Tudnam to the stage. Thank you so much. And just uh, my task now to bring the event to a close. There is some lunch over there. Please do stay and have some food and hopefully enjoy some time together as it's been so rare. But can I, before I bring it to an end, just say some thank yous. First of all, um, can I invite all the young people that played a part to come onto the stage so we can just um, say thank you to you. So please come forward. Yeah, enjoy. Yeah, come on stage. Just stay. Uh, and then, and then if I, um, can I just ask them to be joined by the, the, those hardworking people that just run around in the background, make this happen. Uh, they're probably not all going to be here because they're probably running around doing something to make sure it still works. But can I just ask um, Mark Broadbent, Natasha White, um, Sharon, Mr. Holgate up on here as well. And I think mean, Brogan's probably, yeah, Brogan. And also Liz Smith. Is Liz here as well? Yeah. Come forward. Come on. Come on. Because these are the people. Come on. Come on. These are the people that, that do the work. The work that's just come on the stage just and join us. Come on, around us. These are the people that do the work that the many months, uh, the hours and hours, with our young people that now play such a key role. So, um, they're probably not all here, are they? Liz is, Liz is not here. Liz is busy at the back, which just says everything. Liz is, works at the college, and again, I think she's um, John's chief can-do officer, because Liz is absolutely the key person for the building that makes all of this work, because it's quite, an, uh, quite a, an undertaking. So anyway, so can you join me to thank everyone? Thank you. And my, Michael is open to offers at a good price from BBC, GB News, Channel 4, anyone that's there. But can I just end by saying thank you for coming. Keep working with us. Let's be part of it. And we are Calderdale. Thank you.